three, four, five. All right, well, thanks so much for the information there, Jake, checking in on some very interesting races. Speaking of which, we're going to be heading now to one of our reporters in the field, hearing from him about some different issues going on that are impacting voting patterns this year and how everything is looking at these voting centers. So let's go to the field. Hello. Hey, how you doing, Tyler? How's it going, Jacob? It's going well, thank you. How's everything looking out there? So we're we are currently at uh, Johanna Hayes' uh, campaign headquarters, and uh, as you can see, uh, everyone, all the texts, uh, as I mentioned, are in. Everything is in. All the calls, emails uh, are in. We had just talked to Hayes' campaign manager, and they said that uh, everything is set. So they're just in here, you know, uh, chatting, watching. Uh, the news covering that are covering the elections too and uh we're just in here as well great well it seems like uh there's definitely a lot of votes still to come in for johanna hayes what's the energy like it out there tyler how do you feel like the democrats have a positive outlook on the evening or do people seem a little worried um, I would say that after talking to a lot of people, it's actually very optimistic. Uh, they talked about uh, going to a different location already to celebrate and just, you know, everyone is just going to be together. That seems to be the theme here is just togetherness. Everyone seems to be really tight knit here. Sure. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Tyler. That's awesome. Thanks so much for the update. We'll come back to you later throughout the night. Thank you. Thank you.
Alrighty, well, we're going to be starting here live in a few minutes uh, with our formal show, uh, Election Connection. We're going to be starting right at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also listen to us uh, over the radio at 91.7 FM. And uh, looking forward to tonight. How are you feeling, Alec? Feeling pretty good, Jacob. How do you feel? Oh, I feel great. I think this is going to be a fun one. we got a lot of cool races to go over this evening. A lot of interesting stuff to talk about. A couple races a lot closer than I think a lot of people were initially anticipating them to be. Um, we're seeing that here in Connecticut with races like George Logan and Johanna Hayes going up against one another. We're also seeing that across the nation. Uh, in Pennsylvania, Arizona, a lot of these different races uh, that we thought might be a Democrat stronghold uh, are appearing not to be, which is uh, perhaps a bit of a concern for the DNC. But we'll really have to see how the votes come out because it is far too early to say either way, one way or the other. That's true. They seem to all be at a deadlock. Um, yesterday, uh, NBC polls announced that 47% of uh, registered voters, that's both Republicans and Democrats, are both tied at 47%. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And when you say tied at 47%, do you mean uh, uh, tied as in 47% of registered voters have voted? Or um, just across the nation, you mean? Basically, who would be preferred in Congress? Oh, yes, right. I'm so sorry about that. No, no, that's um, okay. Tied 47% of who they would like to see represent sure. them in Congress. Represent them. Inter interesting. Yeah, yeah that's an that's a interesting statistic. Um, because uh, usually, you know, historically, when we have a Democrat in office, you know, the Republican... Uh, favor might swing a little bit yes you know yes and vice versa obviously during trump's presidency we saw uh the democrat uh, uh favor swing a little bit mm -hmm. among the american population um so very interesting that it is so closely split which is something we're going to be going into a little bit later this evening uh discussing how incredibly polarized the american people are yeah it's gonna be very cool yeah but um all righty well that's that's uh, a lot of the good stuff that we have to talk about for this evening um, one, lack, one last quick thing here, pardon me, <clears throat> um, I know we are, we are live. Yeah. Um, Richard, can you just, uh, ask JC to talk to me, my IFB a little bit? Yeah, uh, ask JC to talk to, uh, Jacob and Jeff. I appreciate it. I just want to test out, make sure that we don't run into any difficulties. I got them loud and clear. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Just wanted, just wanted to make sure, um, because I yes. uh, want to know what's going on, right? We want to be uh, we want to we want to be tuned in to uh, JCFM. Very very important. <laughs> but alrighty, well um, we're gonna be starting here momentarily. Three minutes out. Very exciting tonight. Looking at a lot of those numbers here, I have them in front of me. We're gonna be getting some more information throughout the night. We have Jake Nicolari at the board, who's gonna be providing a lot of cool information on these updates. The energy is high here at Western Connecticut State University. I can tell you it's definitely high across the country as well. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing what comes up tonight. It's going to be a fun one. And it's going to be really, really interesting to see all the different characters that are running for uh, different um, candidate uh, positions and stuff like that. It's really, really, really interesting to see uh, these people and their views on certain topics and to see how um, successful they are in... Right. Um, with the candidacy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, good stuff. So it looks like we're going to be uh, starting here momentarily. Um, two minutes to live. So uh, if you're tuned in currently, don't go anywhere. Feel free to share this link with your friends and family and uh, get them on board because this is going to be a great show tonight. We have a lot of cool stories to cover, a lot of cool interviews. We have an interview with the uh, interim president uh, President Barron uh, for WCSU. So if you are a student or perhaps the parent of a WCSU student, definitely something you'd want to watch. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and then uh, some, some great uh, updates here throughout the evening. And uh, it's going to be a good time. But Alec, what do you think of the issues that we're talking about tonight? What do you think is going to be maybe the most impactful, most hot button thing that people are going to want to tune in for? Um, it would be the two between the threats to the democracy Sure. As well as the uh, economic problems, as well as inflation that we're dealing with in this country right now. I great. think those are the hot topics that voters look like when they're about to um, when they're about to vote. Sure. At the polls. All righty. Well, I, I'd have to agree. I'd have to agree. Definitely, uh, definitely some some cool stuff. But all right. 
Well, back to the graphics. we're going back to a uh, quick WCSU graphic, and uh, in less than 60 seconds, we'll be starting live. So thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to Election Connection, Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage for 2022. I'm Jacob Schultz. This is Election Connection's 12th year, and we are here tonight until midnight with news and issues important to Connecticut. And I'm Alec Riasic. Tonight we're covering national and state races, including those races in Fairfield County. Let's go to the board with Jake Nicolari to talk about those Connecticut races. Jake, make us smarter. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Jacob. And here tonight, we're going to start looking at the races in specifically Connecticut. And later in the night, we'll move to these races outside of Connecticut. We're going to look at the Senate, the House. We'll look at ballot measures in Connecticut. Uh, early voting is on the ballot this year. And then we'll look at Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Utah, Wisconsin. These are key Senate races, and they're going to be very important to who controls the Senate. First tonight, we're going to look at the CT governor race between Ned Lamont and Bob Stefanowski. Ned Lamont, our incumbent, is currently projected to win, but that is no uh, guarantee with the polls just closing a minute ago. Next, we are going to look at CT Senate uh, Richard Blumenthal versus Leora Levy. Uh, Blumenthal and Levy take very different positions on Trump, which makes this race even interesting. Um, the 5th Congressional District is probably one of the most important races in Connecticut right now. It will determine uh, who controls the House this year. Uh, we have Johanna Hayes, the incumbent, versus George Logan. Um, later tonight, we'll get back to results on these races. Uh, the 24th Congressional District is uh, here in Danbury. It's the State Senate. We have our incumbent, Julie Kushner, versus Michelle Coelho. Next, we're going to be looking at the 26th Congressional District uh, in Connecticut. This is between C.C. Mayer and Tony Boucher. These two incumbent, are not incumbents, so that is going to make this race very interesting tonight. Next, we're going to look at the 28th Congressional District, which is in Bethel, uh, very close to Danbury, where we have our incumbent, Tony Huang, versus uh, Tim Gavin. Uh, Next, we will look at the 42nd Congressional District. These are all state Senate districts to Connecticut, similarly to the 111th Congressional District uh, between Amy berger Gravallo and Robert Herbert. Next, we'll look at the Lieutenant Governor position in Connecticut between Susan Beischwitz and Laura Devlin. This race uh, will be interesting, similarly to the Attorney General of Connecticut, where we have our incumbent William Tong versus Jessica Cordes. And uh, the last CT race that we'll be looking at is the Secretary of State between Stephanie Thomas and Dominic Rapplini. And the last race we'll look at to CT tonight will be the probate judge of Danbury. This is you know, home to Danbury where WestCon is. And we'll be looking at Joseph Da Silva versus Dom Chifalo for the probate judge of Danbury. Back to you guys in the studio. Well, thanks so much there, Jake, for giving us an overview of all the races that we're going to be looking at tonight. Some really cool ones and uh, going to be some more that we're going to add in later, uh, different races across the country, things that we're going to be checking in. Uh, and overall, I have to say, definitely a big night tonight. Even though polls have closed in a lot of states, still a lot of counting to be done. 
Um, and one of the things that we've seen nationwide be a problem, especially for the Democratic Party, is the issue of inflation. We've seen inflation spike up quite a bit recently. And we're going to throw up some slides for you here to take a look at while we just have a, a little discussion about it so we can really get a grasp on what inflation is looking like for the average American consumer, how it's affecting them. So what we can see here pretty much, this graph breaks down the percentage increase of different costs of goods. We see all items on the left, food, energy, and then all items besides food or energy. Now look at that energy increase, almost a 20% increase in costs of energy for the average American consumer. Now, I mean, this is... This is this is crazy, right? Yeah. This is hugely impactful yeah. for the average uh, American, for the average voter, and it's something that a lot of people, uh, whether that might be misguided blame or not, mm -hmm. are definitely going to project when voting this year. Absolutely, Jacob. This is where um, people and voters start to look at their pockets and they decide: Should I vote for a person that I have history with not helping me in order to gain money, or should I try something new and sure. vote for somebody that? You know, they haven't told me how they're going to do it, but they say that they have a, another way, a better way of um, fighting inflation. Absolutely. Yeah, it is something that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to really take a close look at how these numbers turn out here tonight. But what I will say is that the economy has always been pretty much the largest predictor of how an election is going to go. Now, it's not always a perfect predictor. I'm certainly not saying that. But... In Gallup polls from the last month or so, we've seen that the largest issue that Americans care about is inflation. It's something that's impacting gas prices. It's impacting uh, costs of living across the board. And uh, it might be a problem for Democrats tonight. But we'll have to see. Uh, speaking of which, there's also other things that Americans have been concerned by. And one of the top issues among them is democracy, the sanctity of democracy in our, our own political system, and if it is really functioning as designed. We have a Pew Research poll from earlier this year mm -hmm. that showed that two-thirds of American adults were dissatisfied with the current American political system. So definitely begs the question, is democracy at risk? Let's take a look. I've seen a lot of the polling data. It's been pulled together at my request and being worked on, I think, as we speak. Good. Which is more secure, American democracy or the British monarchy? Holy moly. Because all we've been talking about here recently is the polling data that suggests how concerned Americans are about the future of democracy and the threat of violence. Are we going to make it? Is there a civil war on the horizon? And you're already familiar, ladies and gentlemen, because I share the data routinely with you, that there's, there's real cause for concern in the United States. Well, so definitely some, uh, some interesting comments there from the uh, Smirk Corner show, something that uh, a lot of people have been thinking about. And when we look at the Gallup polls from earlier this year, mm -hmm. right, obviously chief among the issues that Americans are worrying about is inflation. But when it comes to social issues, the safety of democracy is, uh, is one of the top ones as well. Now, Alec, is there anything that you think might have have caused might have catalyzed that sort of increase in public distrust towards democracy i think when you when americans go and they see that their paycheck isn't as big as that how it used to be or they see that um gas is extremely um more expensive than how it has been recently sure. you have to as a voter you have to say What's going on mm -hmm. and i think from that that is what's swaying what's going on right now and how they're thinking no I, I would definitely be inclined to agree now it's worth noting that one of the key tenets of democracy is everyone having a set mm -hmm. right everyone being able to to vote and impact the political system mm -hmm. in one form or another regardless of where they might stand on the political spectrum however in recent years Polarization among, pol among politically active Americans, pardon me, has become increasingly severe. We're seeing people on the right get more right. We're seeing people on the left get more left wing. And it's something that uh, a lot of people are concerned about as well, increasing political divisions. So uh, one of the, the sort of characters, I guess you could say, uh, or one of the people, one of the governors that uh, a lot of people are painting as a catalyst for this increased political polarization is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. So let's take a look at that story right now. 
I'm Alec Riasic. I'm here with Jake Nicolari and Josh Rodriguez to discuss, is our democracy safe? Thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I'd like to start this discussion tonight just by talking about a little information from Pew Research, um, you know, very uh, reliable source of information. They have found that 85% of Americans believe that democracy needs major changes or complete reform. And, you know, that's a pretty drastic statement. So I was wondering, like, what do you guys think about that in relation to American democracy? At times I feel like our government is run by people that are a tad bit older than most people that live in America today. Um, I feel like they're being represented um, not well by the age groups that are shown. So I think that we need younger people to represent our country as, as well as older people, but I feel like it should be an even share. Yeah, I think, well, for me, democracy, I'm going to uh, tackle this in a little bit different direction, but I feel that democracy is a pretty broad uh, term. Um, when people ask, you know, what democracy means to you, everybody sort of has their own version of it. Uh, so when this poll, like when I was seeing this poll, it's like, well, what, the, what version of democracy are they really worried about? Is it more about, you know, are they worried that... Um, that they can't uh, sort of express themselves if they're, you know, let's say um, uh, pro-choice or, you know, if they're against vaccinations or is this sort of the, the version of democracy where it's like, hey, I want to um, sort of, you know, express myself, whether uh, it's it's through my own self-identification, sort of with pronouns and those sort of things. So for me, I, I was a little bit more hesitant to see exactly what exactly do they mean by whose democracy is in danger because each of them have sort of their own concerns um, and I think that's sort of a, a valid argument here to, to uh, go on. I Yeah, I think that that is very true. I think, you know, beyond just people having their own opinions on democracy, polling is a very uh, subjective statement uh, based on the question will change people's answers. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a protector. So God made a fighter. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, kiss his family goodbye, travel thousands of miles for no other reason than to serve the people, to save their jobs, their livelihoods, their liberty, their happiness. So God made a fighter. God said, I need someone to be strong, advocate truth in the midst of hysteria, someone who challenges conventional wisdom and isn't afraid to defend what he knows to be right and just. So God made a fighter. God said, I need somebody who will take the arrows, stand firm in the wake of unrelenting attacks, look a mother in the eyes and tell her that her child will be in school. She can keep her job, go to church, eat dinner with friends, and hold the hand of an aging parent, taking their breath for the last time. So God made a fighter. God said, I need a family man. A man who would laugh and then sigh, and then reply with smiling eyes when his daughter says, she wants to spend her life doing what dad does. So God made a fighter. So when we discuss political polarization in America, right, uh, one has to ask themselves where ads like this sort of fall into the mix. Right? If there's any, any impact, any influence from something like this, that I'm sure a lot of Republicans might be in favor for. But a lot of opponents of DeSantis are going to look... Oh, actually, pardon me. It looks as if we have some breaking news here. It appears that one of the races we're covering tonight uh, has actually already been called. Let's go to Jake Nicolari at the board, who's going to fill us in. Thank you so much, Jacob. Tonight, breaking news, we have already determined who is going to be the senator of Connecticut. Continuing on, uh, AP Associated Press has already determined that Richard Blumenthal, our incumbent, has won this election um, against his opponent, Leora Levy. So 
We are going to confirm those numbers later on tonight, but Associated Press has already determined that Richard Blumenthal has won. Um, back to you guys in the studio. Well, thanks so much for the update there, Jake. Definitely uh, uh, quite something for Blumenthal's race to be called so this, quick. this early yeah. in the evening. Yeah. Very quick. Against um, oh, such a challenger like Leora Levy, yes. I would think that she you know, would bring, um, it would take voters until late in the night before they were done counting up this vote, before they made a, a final decision. Absolutely. Well, this was uh, a race with Blumenthal as the incumbent, especially in a pretty traditionally blue state, Absolutely. blue area. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely surprising to me that we saw um, such a, a heavy blowout, if you will, uh, from the Blumenthal campaign. Not that surprising, though, granted, it is very quick. Okay. Uh, but the Associated Press will uh, have an official count of, of votes later this evening, mm -hmm. which we'll, uh, we'll go over. But seriously, uh, a very, very interesting that it was called so early. So early. And mm -hmm. Levy was backed by President Donald Trump. Uh, she was his pick in this race. And it really does beg the question of how Trump's endorsement or lack thereof might impact um, different Republican candidates in, in this election cycle and also further down the road. Jacob, do you believe that um, this endorsement for this particular candidate um, uh, harmed um, Leora Levy as she ran? Well, it's hard to say. It's hard to say if it, if it harmed her, her chances or improved them. I will say that, you know, there's something about a Trump endorsement that most likely invigorates uh, Republicans who voted for Trump mm -hmm. over, you know, the last six years, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I'll also say that I think it probably cut down, severely cut down however many votes she may have gotten from people who are more moderate, maybe people who were uh, uh, Democrats who, who maybe might lean to the right a little yes. bit, you know, who mm -hmm. wouldn't have voted for Blumenthal. Mm -hmm. And they probably decided to vote for Blumenthal because they were like, all right, well, if she's backed by Trump, I don't want to essentially vote for Trump is how a lot of people yes. view endorsements like that. Yes. So it's hard to say exactly because I think there's a, a helping factor and a negative factor, but I would probably lean towards maybe it negatively influenced um, Levy's campaign. But again, it is hard to say because a lot of Republicans still really like Trump, even after everything that's happened in uh, 2016 and, and subsequently 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be interesting. I mean, that's a topic we're going to dive into a little bit later uh, throughout the evening, but it'll be very interesting to see what exactly happens in 2024. Yes. Though, of course, we can't predict. Yes. That's two years down the line. Um, it'll be interesting to see. So we actually have some more breaking news. Uh, so we're going to be getting some numbers from Jake Nicolari at the board on another race that's I, same race, actually, the Blumenthal race. Uh, let's take a look at those numbers and break down the votes. Jake, let's see what you got. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you once again, Jacob, but we did want to just confirm with some of the numbers that we're getting from Associated Press that Richard Blumenthal has actually won. He's won by about 60% of the vote, so we're looking at um, those numbers right now, and we will continue to develop these numbers when more of the votes from Connecticut do come in, but this is uh, what the Associated Press has determined Richard Blumenthal's win based off of. Back to you guys. Well, thank you so much, Jake, for those updates. Uh, definitely interesting. And uh, like I said, we're going to be getting some more numbers throughout the evening. But anyway, so we actually have a quick piece of trivia for some of our uh, watchers right now. So we're going to put up on screen for you here a quote. And this is a great quote. You can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And as for who said that, I'm sure some of you have many guesses. You know who said it, Alec? I have no idea. Well, it was Abraham Lincoln, uh, President Abraham Lincoln, actually. And it's a, it's a very interesting quote, and I think that uh, it might be something that actually resonates with a lot of people currently. Absolutely, a lot of people, because it's true. You can't, you can't uh, please everybody in the room. You're never going to. That, well, absolutely not. And certainly, certainly not with politics. Yeah, exactly. And you <laughs> cannot, not only that, but you cannot... Um, People will catch on to what you say. Um, unfortunately, that's just that's just a way of life. But it's how um, people or how candidates go through that, how they uh, maneuver around that, that gets them the uh, potential seat at the end of the day. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Politics is really a game of what you can say in order to get people's votes without them realizing that you are 
blatantly lying to them yep. <laughs> or, or blatantly overstating mm -hmm. what you can accomplish. And, we, and that's a common thing in America, American politics. We, we've seen that the last, you know, who knows how long. Uh, yeah, it was it, um, too long. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very common thing. And, and some would say that even that quote from Lincoln could possibly relate to um, the, uh, the mainstream media, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, here comes our, uh, our second quote. Uh, another quote for some of our viewers to take a look at. Quote, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. Unquote. Now, that's another fantastic quote, and one that I think resonates with a lot of people today, which is actually, again, from former President Abraham Lincoln. And pretty much the substance of that quote, what that is saying is that there's going to be new strifes, new challenges, which we're all going to face on an individual basis, also on a national basis, politically. We've seen that over the last few years with COVID-19. We're seeing that now with different conflicts in Eastern Europe. We are struggling with inflation as a nation, as a country. And... Uh, we have to rise with the tide. Absolutely, we have to we have to rise and uh, and fight, you know, whatever uh, might might come for us. And so, the world with climate change as well. Well, absolutely, yeah. climate change is something that a lot of voters are definitely concerned about, and we, we have seen that uh, in a lot of different polls, and and it's one of the top social issues that people are concerned about outside of things like the economy, and uh, and abortion and other issues like mm -hmm. that, which we're going to be diving into in great detail later this evening. But let's head now to a quick weather update. So we're going to hear from our student meteorologist, Stephen. Stephen, what do you got for us? What's the weather looking like? Well, thank you very much. And, you know, while we've been doing our rehearsals for this uh, broadcast tonight, we've pretty much had quiet weather. Unfortunately, we have the exact opposite of that uh, over the next few days. So we'll show you that. But first, it is calm right now. As of 7 o'clock, fair skies, temperatures in the mid 40s. So definitely cooler than we've had recently, but dry uh, conditions, very low humidity. And our headlines, we will have a few more warm days, not tomorrow, but Thursday and Friday do look mild before we do have to deal with a major storm Friday and Saturday. And then the chance for our first snowflakes perhaps on Sunday night. We'll get to that in just a moment. Our current satellite, not much going on right now. That will change, however, over the next couple of days. And radar shows a similar story with Dan Barry being right here. Find wherever you are on this map and no matter what, where you are, there is no rain in sight. Unfortunately, though, this is the first problem we have to deal with. This is Tropical Storm Nicole. It's way down here in the Bahamas, and it will be making landfall on the east coast of Florida as a hurricane on Thursday before taking a turn to the north and going very close to or directly over the Danbury area, unfortunately, in the overnight hours of Friday into Saturday. So what does that mean? Well, unfortunately, we could have quite a big impact here in Connecticut locally with one to four inches of rain possible along with wind gusts as high as 50 miles an hour, maybe a little bit higher than that, especially along coastal areas. And a few tree or power line damage, er, damage areas are possible. It's not nearly going to be as bad as tr something like Tropical Storm Isaias, uh, especially because there aren't any leaves on the trees, but this is still a nasty event for your evening on Friday. The good news though tonight we will be dry we will be clear but we will also be very cold with a low of only 25 degrees so definitely not the uh, warmest evening uh, coming up tonight before tomorrow a nice day but again cooler than the last few sunny and seasonable but seasonable is going to feel outright chilly compared to what we've been dealing with the last few days so Thursday though the mild air does return and we're going to have another day up in the mid 60s Friday even warmer but then Friday afternoon uh, that what is left of Tropical Storm Nicole will impact the area with, again, very heavy rain and strong wind Friday night into Saturday. The first part of Sunday, the second half of Saturday, the first part of Sunday looked dry. Then Sunday afternoon, showers move into the area, and in the overnight hours, there's a chance that they could end as a little bit of wet snow, especially in the Litchfield Hills. So a bit of a wild weather week coming up, uh, unlike what we've had recently. So definitely something to keep an eye on. Let's go back to you guys. Well, thanks so much for the update there, Stephen. Really do appreciate that. And definitely something to look out for if you have any weekend plans. So something that uh, we're going to want to uh, 
be conscious of as we're going outside. Definitely a warm November so far, uh, but we'll have to see moving forward if that uh, changes at all. Now we're going to be heading to our first field team of the evening. This is our field reporter, Ryan. He's going to be giving us an update on the Blumenthal-Levy race, which we were just covering at the board. So let's hear from Ryan. How's everything going tonight, Ryan? Thank you, Jacob. So the atmosphere here is really great at the Democratic headquarters. We have Blumenthal supporters and Lamont supporters. And I think going into tonight, everyone expected a pretty solid victory with both candidates up by a heavy margin in the polls. However, as we heard um, earlier in the broadcast, I don't think any of us expected this Blumenthal and Levy race to be called so early. And I think there's a lot of topics that went into this race that could have impacted such a thing. So of course, first of all, we have the topic of abortion and the, in particular, the question of whether Connecticut should be what is being called a safe harbor for abortion, which is basically in states where abortion is restricted, making Connecticut a safe place that will pay for legal fees, pay for travel fees for people seeking abortions. Blumenthal also rode on the wave of democratic accomplishments, such as the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, the pandemic relief package. Levy, on the other hand, used these things to criticize Blumenthal, saying these were what led to things like inflation, higher gas prices, etc. However, it doesn't really seem like these concerns have resonated with voters. Great. Well, thanks so much for the information there, Ryan. Now, real quick here, how do you think that voter demographics have maybe played a part in this election? So a really interesting thing when we break down the voter demographic going into this Levy Blumenthal race was found within female voters. And this may lead us back to the question of abortion. So female voters were leaning heavily in Blumenthal's favor going into tonight. And a lot of people have chopped that up to the fact that Blumenthal is much more pro-choice than Levy. Levy has considered herself pro-life uh, with the exception of rape and incest. However, in such a blue state like Connecticut, which wants to have an increasing role with being seen as uh, a safe place for people to seek abortions, obviously this didn't play too well with voters. And I, I think we see that demographic split today with the race being called so, uh, so early. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, really, really uh, interesting stuff to see there, Ryan, sort of that, that shift and split, if you will, among the voting base. Now, we were mentioning this a little bit earlier in the evening, but do you think that Leora Levy's ties to President Donald Trump, her endorsement from him, do you think that that's played a part at all in how people are voting this November? Yeah, so that was a huge topic going into uh, this um, election. It got a lot of headlines. And of course, Leora, Le uh, Leora Levy was at Trump's Mar-a-Lago fundraiser where he endorsed her. He endorsed her, I think, the day of the primary election day. And that obviously got a lot of headlines. And then moving towards this election against Blumenthal in the general election, we saw her sort of stick away from the Trump endorsement and basically say that it isn't Trump on the ballot, it is her. However, of course, Blumenthal used this as an easy mode of attacking her, especially in such a blue state like Connecticut, where obviously voters voted overwhelmingly in favor for Joe Biden. This didn't really play well, well with voters, and I think we're seeing how that played out tonight with such an early call. Yeah, definitely. It seems to me as if there was a really unexpected swing away from a Trump-endorsed candidate, which I was mentioned to Alec before, is almost unsurprising, especially in a state like this one where a lot of moderates are not really going to want to vote for someone who they feel is endorsed by a right-wing president, so to speak. But thanks so much for all the information, Ryan. I really do appreciate it. This has been great, and we're going to come back to you throughout the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Of course. Well, so interesting uh, race there that's been called so incredibly early. Definitely something that we were not expecting. Not at all. Um, as we are seeing in a couple different states, voting and counting uh, being predicted to go on late into the evening, even perhaps for a few days, mm -hmm. which is a trend that we haven't really seen in American politics before, barring, of course, the, uh, the 2020 presidential election. We had some of those races go on for days and days after uh, the actual 
voting count was closed. It seems so, like, Jacob, it seems like the more controversy um, around each election, the more um, time we have to wait to actually get the final results. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Now, Alec, do you think that that is entirely due to, you know, sort of the increasing polarization in America that we're talking about, or is there something else at hand there? I think it's due to the increasing polarization, as you say, but it's also due to um, people thinking that it's not right. And yes, that does add to what you said, the increasing polarization. So I, I think that that's the strong, um, strong reasoning behind it. And it also gets, uh, there's also much fuel to the fire whenever you see um, people post online how they feel and how um, in outlandish ways. And that's what really um, sure. heightens it to another level. No, I would, I would be inclined to agree. Yeah, for sure. It seems as if we are seeing polarization really make some of these races a little bit tighter than we thought they might be. We're seeing that here in Connecticut, uh, that race between Johanna Hayes and George absolutely, Logan, absolutely. right, um, is a lot closer than I expect. I, I believe that, in fact, today they, they were actually declared to be tied, mm -hmm. um, almost an even race, 49%, 49% for each candidate. Very hard to predict where exactly that's going to and end up. And this happened also with um, Mehmet Oz and as well as uh, Paul Fe Fetterman, or John Fetterman, and also uh, Raphael Warnock and um, Herschel Walker. Yes, a lot of races are very, very close, and uh, I think I think that's somewhat expected for a midterm election, especially you have a lot of Republicans running who are trying to sort of uproot different policies uh, that a lot of voters feel could be causing some of the inflation uh, that we are experiencing as a country. Mm -hmm. So I think it is somewhat expected. But another thing that Americans are greatly concerned about is government overreach, as it specifically deals to the issue of Roe v. Wade being overturned. So we're going to go now to a brief story about menstrual cycle tracking apps and some privacy concerns with those. So let's take a look. The flame of anger, frustration, and terror of people across the United States have been burning fiercely since June 24, 2022, when the Supreme Court overturned the legendary Roe v. Wade decision. But for many, the repercussions of the decision are seeping into parts of their lives that are a little unexpected. Digital privacy. Popular menstrual cycle apps such as Clue and Flow are now being used in certain states to track a woman's cycle to determine whether or not she has had an abortion, to which if the answer is yes, they could face prosecution. Courts can now subpoena women's phones to determine when a pregnancy supposedly started and supposedly ended. If the time intervals match up and it could be proven that these women had abortions, there is a possibility to be charged with fetal assault. This kind of charge could lead up to 12 years in prison in certain states. While in Connecticut, it is legal to abort until viability, data privacy affects phone users anywhere and everywhere. In states such as Alabama, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, women have already begun to be prosecuted. This news raises concerns not only about having access to safe abortions, but also America's data privacy. Tech giants like Facebook have recently been heavily criticized for the sheer size of their data collections on its users, collecting information about where you got your paycheck to what brand of underwear you use. It is estimated that Facebook has their software in 61 out of 100 most popular smartphone apps, as well as trackers in about 25% of the websites to collect data to be able to personalize your online experience. So what does that mean for Connecticut's residents? The state has drawn up the Connecticut Privacy Act, which is a comprehensive state consumer privacy law that defines personal data as any information that is linked or reasonably linkable to an identified or identifiable individual. The law will go in effect June 1st, 2023. Other Connecticut politicians have weighed in on how important the topic is of cybersecurity. This is what Senator Blumenthal had to say about data privacy. We have a vote underway and I think that this issue ought to be bipartisan. There is nothing political in the sense of party about violations of privacy. Senator Blumenthal and 5th Congressional State Johanna Hayes were both outraged by the Supreme Court hearing and have put their foot down when it comes to bringing that kind of legislation to Connecticut. Both of their opponents in Leora Levy and George Logan have yet to give back a response to us on their views on the overturn of Roe v. Wade and digital privacy. In the coming months, repercussions of the Supreme Court ruling will unfold. This is Alec Riasic for WCSU News Election Connection. So quite a story there, something that I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear about. 
Absolutely, um, yeah. Definitely something that, you know, Amer Americans like their privacy, right? And uh, when you start to interfere with that, uh, it's, it's something that I think in the opinion of most people uh, should, be, should be cut down. Right? Jacob, what we don't know is uh, whenever we sign up for Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and these uh, menstrual cycle apps, they, um, we get, we get um, put, as we first sign in, we get put to a, um, a terms of uh, service uh, screen. Right. And in that terms of service, we have very, very small print, and we're supposed to read all that small print before we uh, click uh, accept and continue. Sure. We don't read the small print. So because we don't read that small print, the small print has, um, especially in the menstrual cycle apps, it has um, uh, reading saying that courts can come and subpoena a woman based on um, if time cycles matched up and if they think that they had an abortion or not. So cops can come and uh, courts can come and come question you on if they don't see if anything's right, if they don't see um, if um, it matches up. So if you give birth, um, if you give birth and, um, oh man, I'm sorry about that. No, it's, it's, I, I, you know, it's something that I know is difficult to talk yeah. about, right? You know, cause there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts here and it's something that, uh, we have to, when we're looking at this, we have to be careful, you know, about how we go about it. Because I think that a lot of Americans, this, this particularly is an issue that yeah. polarizes a lot of Americans. And it's very scary to women. It, well, it is. It is scary to women. It's scary to a lot of people. Yeah. Because you know the the views on abortion vary from either you are killing a baby, mm -hmm. to either you are preventing a woman from having human bodily autonomy. Right. And it just works by a click of a button saying terms accepted. Um, let me start using the app now. And that's that's just how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now speaking of uh, positions on abortion and how polarizing this can be, we're seeing stark differences among candidates. We're going to talk about a few later in the evening that might actually have some similarities when it comes to this issue. But for right now, we are seeing a lot of candidates uh, in Connecticut and nationwide who are following traditional party lines when it comes to their stances on abortion. So let's take a look at uh, candidate for uh, Governor Ned Lamont, uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, Rob Stefanowski's position on abortions as well. So let's take a look. Governor, the right for access to an abortion is an important issue for the students of WCS or WCSU. Would you care to elaborate your position on this issue? I was shocked when the Supreme Court uh, overturned 50 years of precedent. Roe v. Wade was uh, seven to two in the Supreme Court, Republicans and Democrats uh, saying um, enough. We've got this is a reasonable compromise going forward and let's make this the law of the land. It was the right thing then. It's the right thing now. And um, so I'll, I'll say two things. One, <coughs> governors are going to be really important and legislatures because uh, the Supreme Court for now is throwing it back to the states and you see dozens of um, states that are really outlawing a woman's right to choose. And I might say, Republicans, I don't wanna hear any more lectures about freedom and big government. This is the biggest encroachment on freedom and women's freedom um, in my lifetime and I'm old. Um, <laughs> I, I just uh, add, um, you know where Susan Weiss was, uh, and my, I stand, we're gonna be airtight, we're gonna be a firewall, and we're gonna protect anybody that wants to come into Connecticut uh, to exercise their reproductive rights. But I'm running against somebody who's uh, maxed out his donations to anti-choice Senate candidates, um, Leora Levy, if she goes down to Washington, she'll vote to outlaw a woman's right to choose across the country. So the choice there is very clear. Mr. Stefanowski, the right for access to abortion is an important one for students of WCSU and Connecticut citizens all around. Would you care to elaborate your position on this issue? Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation spread by the governor. I, um, as you probably know, Roe v. Wade is codified into Connecticut state law. Um, I intend to support Connecticut state law. It is not going to change. Um, I believe a woman has the right to choose. The law is not going to change as long as I'm governor. It's codified, and, and and that's it. Period. We're going to protect, uh, going to protect that right. Thank you so much, Mr. Stefanowski. And just to follow up, if people from out of state wanted to uh, get an abortion in Connecticut, would you be willing to provide protections for them? 
Well, I think the bill that was passed just provides those protections. I don't intend to to, to repeal that bill. So I think uh, with the, the bill that was passed, I think those protections are there. Well, some interesting takes there on the issue of abortion from Bob Stefanowski and Governor Ned Lamont. We've talked about abortion quite a bit here, and we are going to come back to it throughout the evening. But for right now, we're going to change gears a bit and uh, celebrate WXCI's, which is Western Connecticut State University's radio channel, their 50th anniversary, which is crazy, five decades of WXCI. We'd like to... Uh, we like to give them just a thanks, and uh, we are streaming live there as well. So uh, let's take a look at an interview that I did with uh, a member of the WXCI radio station. And uh, he actually, um, my apologies, we're coming back to that, uh, that interview a little bit later. But for now, I just want to say thank you to WXCI um, for, uh, for their support and for their, th their help throughout the years. We've been working with them for, I believe, 11 years now. Here at Election wow. Connection, which is uh, very cool. Really, really great stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's always great when, when we can collaborate with another sort of student uh, organization like that. And um, really, really good stuff. Yep, I'm a part of both organizations, and I can say that this it's just really fun. Just both collaborating with both, especially as a, this huge project, it's just really fun to be a part of. Absolutely, and I have to say that uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people who probably enjoy listening to... Uh, to that radio station and it's I, i've listened to it before it's great and um it's it's just fantastic so what we're going to do now is take a look at that interview with uh, mr evan walker from wxci oh at the at the tribute uh to wxci rob abbott nicknamed rabbit began the first ever broadcast with good afternoon this is fm radio station wxci in danbury beginning its first broadcast day. These words were just the beginning of an illustrious history for the many voices of the past and today heard on WXCI. I'm DJ Poppins on 91.7 FM, coming to you from the Midtown campus of Western Connecticut State University. We will be celebrating 50 years of continuous student-run radio in 2023. Since the beginning of Election Connection in 2011, WXCI has been right there, streaming the show on FM airwaves. WXCI's history with election coverage dates back to our beginnings from 1973. In the 70s, election results were reported on WXCI because FM radio continued to broadcast long after other media sources signed off for the night. In 1982, as documented in Rolling Stone magazine, WXCI was one of the leading college radio and FM stations playing alternative rock. This introduced such groups as REM, Talking Heads, Depeche Mode, U2, the B-52s, among others, to the greater Danbury listening community. That's right, it's all been happening here at WXCI. This is, uh... These listeners included high school students, some of whom would join the ranks of WXCI DJs. WXCI showed up in print again in Piper Kerman's 2010 memoir, Orange is the New Black. She reminisced listening to WXCI's specialty show, 90s Mixtape, as a soundtrack for her life. Today, we look back and see WXCI provided joy through music, camaraderie, and the Alumni Life Membership Program. The station served as a training ground and opened doors into professional radio. In 2023, we look forward to celebrating 50 years on the airwaves. Please show, share your love, support, and memories with us on our Facebook page, WXCI 91.7 Alumni, and our contact info on WXCI.org. Thank you. So, wonderful tribute there to our student radio station. And uh, again, huge thanks to WXCI for all their support of Election Connection throughout the years. But we're going to head now to one of our field reporters, our second field reporter of the night, Mr. Tyler Bowie. He's going to give me us some information on the Johanna Hayes versus George Logan race. 
Yeah, Jacob. So we're here just outside the Johanna Hayes campaign headquarters. I was just in there a few moments ago talking to her campaign manager as well as a few of her supporters. And there seems to be a large sense of optimism in this campaign. Uh, before I get into anything, I just want to cover a few things that these two are going to be fighting for if elected. Um, Johanna Hayes has been fighting for things such as agriculture, uh, climate change, gun violence protection, education, and nutrition. Whereas Logan has been advocating for things like being a voice against Washington's failing policies, bringing the gas prices down, and fighting inflation. Well, thanks so much for the information there and the overview of how things are looking, Tyler. That's great. Now, uh, George Logan doesn't really have the typical Republican view on abortion. How do you think that his policy prescriptions on reproductive rights, as many are calling it, how do you think that that might impact the election uh, so far? Yeah, like you mentioned, Logan has definitely gone away from that typical Republican view. He's not wanting to be boxed in by that, uh, you know, stereotype any longer. So this view on abortion that he has, he has now defined himself as pro-choice. And he has uh, said that if, if elected, he would not vote for a federal abortion ban, but has already voted no to codifying Roe v. Wade into federal law. So Logan is not allowing the Democratic Party to any longer have that step up on the um, election in this abortion sense. Interesting. And that's definitely an interesting position for George Logan to take, as we have seen uh, with the Blumenthal-Levy race, that abortion turned out to be quite a splitting factor for a lot of the female voters especially. Now, one of Johanna Hayes's top issues is climate change. Has she done anything specific to address that issue that you're aware of? Yeah, so like you mentioned, uh, one of her main points is the climate and environment change and focusing on that. So one of the things that she's done so far is create the Clean Commute for Kids and the Clean School Bus Act, which so far has allocated billions of dollars into getting rid of these diesel school buses that we currently have and putting that money into zero emission buses. She's already negotiated with the White House and the Senate for $5 billion to uh, get these deals done. Great. Well, it's great to hear that she's uh, executing well on a lot of her uh, promises. Now, and Tyler, I have a quick question. Do you believe that um, Johanna Hayes is starting to tackle these issues because she is struggling with the issues of uh, inflation and the economy going on in the 24th District? Uh, so, so far, just after talking to her campaign manager and some of her supporters, I was able to get some insight on that and I know that they are her supporters, but they do not feel as if she has done that. And it's just out of the kindness of her heart, basically. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Tyler. Uh, I really do appreciate the, the update there. And we'll come back to you throughout the evening for more stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jacob. Absolutely. Well, as we previously compared Bob Stefanowski and Governor Ned Lamont, they have some differing positions on a, a variety of policy prescriptions. And uh, one of those is actually how they're dealing with climate change. Definitely a social issue that a lot of Americans are concerned about and something that we're probably going to see become more impactful on the political stage in the coming decades. So let's take a look. I need young people to continue to remind the legislature that we've got to make more progress on climate change. I can tell you some good news. Uh, the good news is that um, our electric grid is um, going to be 95% carbon free over the next four or five years. Um, that is because it's already um, more than 50% because of carbon free nuclear power. And we've now uh, tripled down on wind power. Um, and we don't have enough land to do a lot of um, wind turbines on land, but this is offshore. I think that's going to make an extraordinary difference. So my next uh, job, um, Nico and Evan, is to move our transportation sector away from the internal combustion engine. This is going to take uh, a long period of time, like 15 years, but we're starting now. And one of the things we're doing, thanks to um, the uh, infrastructure bill and the um, Inflation Reduction Act is we're going to have um, 
you know, well over 100 uh, electric charging stations on all of our major roads. So, um, Nico, you don't have to suffer from range anxiety any longer. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are, and that plus the fact that we got significant subsidies for electric cars, I think you'll see Connecticut uh, to be continue to be a real leader um, when it comes to a carbon-free future. Um, that said, we're a small state, and I work very closely with other governors, but we're not that big a region. So I really need the uh, feds to follow our lead and to follow California's lead. We absolutely need to focus on climate change. I, and, and I think we've set some ambitious goals that are outside of the governor's tenure. And I think it's very easy to set goals that you don't have to deliver. So um, I also think his approach has been to slap taxes on fossil fuels, which in my opinion is not the way to go. Um, so I think we need to be more proactive. I think we need to consider more ultimate forms of, of energy and, um, you know, I think we need to be serious about it. And, and I'm not sure that we've gotten serious about it in Connecticut other than setting these lofty goals that no one has any idea whether we're going to meet them. Thank you, Mr. Stefanowski. And follow up. So would you uh, be willing to invest in alternative forms of energy such as solar? I think we have to. I think, you know, clearly um, solar, wind, um, green hydrogen is, is another big opportunity. And I think we need to start looking in that direction. Well, we need to do it cautiously because you don't want to price people out of the market with crazy um, expensive forms of energy. But um, I think we could be moving faster. I think we could be more proactive and I think we could do a better job. Thank you, Mr. Stefanowski. We appreciate that. All right, well, some uh, interesting opinions there on climate change from our two candidates, Stefanowski and, uh, and, and Lamont. Mm -hmm. Something that I think a lot of Connecticut voters are going to resonate with on either side of the aisle is that we need to do something about the issue at hand here, yes. right? We yes. can't just leave it as the way that it has been and allow things to sort of take their, uh, their natural course. It doesn't seem to be working so far, so need to, something needs to be done. If it does right? take their natural course, we'll be underwater, Jake. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, so we're going to head now to our field reporter, uh, Jimmy. He's going to be giving us some updates on the Kushner v. Coelho race. So let's hear from him. Thank you, Jacob. I am out here in Danbury, Connecticut, outside the Republican headquarters. And tonight I'm going to be focusing on the 24th Senate District between incumbent Julie Kushner and Michelle Coelho. Now, Julie Kushner, she's focusing her key issues on... Um, cutting down on, yeah, she is focusing her key issues on expanding uh, Connecticut's rainy day fund, as well as um, a woman's right to choose. Now, her competition, Michelle Coelho, she is focusing on expanding police funding and trying to keep those communities safe out there, as well as cutting down on Connecticut taxes to hopefully increase a little bit more spending for the middle class. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Jimmy. Thanks so much for the information. Uh, very good overview there. Now, these two candidates seem to have a lot that they really severely differ on. Um, now, is there anything that they might have in common with each other in terms of policy prescriptions? Yeah, so a lot different about these two candidates for sure. But at their recent candidate forum in Richfield, um, hosted by the League of Women Voters, um, she, she, Michelle Coelho and Julie Kushner both had to agree on one thing, and that was the early voting question um, on the ballot this year. And both both parties want to get as many voters as possible to, to the polls and as many people to vote as that does um, vote for a strong democracy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that answer there, Jimmy. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, it's glad to hear that there's some common ground between the two candidates. Now, what do you think seems to be the top issue for voters in this district? Yeah, so according to public opinion this year, it seems that inflation and the economy are still at the top of mind 
of voters. And we see that reflected in both Kushner and Coelho's um, key issues. Um, Kushner, she's saying what she has done in her past terms in terms of increasing minimum wage to $15. And she says she's going to do even more for the middle class and low income families and getting them more money. Um, whereas Coelho, she's saying we need to cut the taxes that are already here in order to get a little more wiggle room for these families, especially going into a winter where oil prices are just so high. Yeah, definitely something that we need to uh, be concerned with and, and keep an eye on. So thanks so much, Jimmy. I really do appreciate it. And we'll be coming back to you throughout the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. All right. Well, obviously, some uh, some interesting looks there at how the candidates are doing here. Um, Michelle Coelho and, uh, and, and Kushner are definitely two different candidates in a Very lot of their different. prescriptions. We saw that uh, when we, uh, as a class, uh, our election connection class, we attended a candidate forum mm -hmm. uh, in Ridgefield. Women's League of Voters, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was that was quite something. Definitely some, some different issues brought up there. Especially the closing remarks. Yeah, that was something. Of course, of course. Absolutely, yeah. yeah we'll get more into that later. But for right now, we're going to head to the board with Jake Nicolari. He's giving us some updates on different elections. Jake, what do you have for us? Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Jacob. Right now, at the end of the hour, we are going to be looking at races outside of Connecticut, the races that are important to who controls the Senate and who controls the House. So uh, obviously, we're talking about something. This is the Senate majority. Uh, Democrats usually uh, lose or the incumbent party, whoever is the president. Uh, but this year, Democrats might actually be able to hold on. And those races, those key races are in Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, New Hampshire, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Utah, and Wisconsin. And something impressive about this election that we've seen is that 45 million mail-in ballots were sent in this year. This, this is more uh, than we have had in previous years and really indicates voter enthusiasm this year. The first race we're going to look at is in Arizona. We haven't had any um, results from this race. Very close race between Mark Kelly, the incumbent, and Blake Masters. Uh, Kelly was just voted in in 2020, so he has a good chance to hold on, but Blake Masters has really given him a run for his money. Next, we're going to look at the Georgia Senate race. Now, this race has closed, and we have been looking at results so far. Warnock, with a very short lead, only 40,000 votes of Herschel Walker. This is really reflecting the polling and the uh, predictions for this race. It's going to be very close, possibly with a runoff in December, uh, at which will continue to uh, pressure the House uh, in the Senate majority. Next, we're going to look at the Nevada Senate race. Uh, this race will come in at about 10 p.m. tonight, so make sure to tune in later for more results. Um, in New Hampshire, we're looking at current uh, race results. We have uh, Maggie Hassan, our uh, incumbent, who is currently about 22,000 votes ahead of Bulldog. Now, this is really early in the night and does not guarantee any win, but it is a good sign for the Democrat Party of New Hampshire. Next, we're going to be looking at a really important race in Swing State, Ohio, where we have uh, two new candidates. Uh, J Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance have been going hard at each other, insulting each other during debates. And um, we're seeing that Tim Ryan is actually pulling ahead of predictions which had J.D. Vance uh, winning. But this does not guarantee anything because many of those votes were probably from mail-in ballots, which get counted faster, uh, compared to Republican voters who majority vote in person on the day of the election. Um, so we'll be back with more updates on that race later. Uh, another key race this year is going to be the Pennsylvania Senate race between John Fetterman and Mehmet Oz. This race um, is predicted to be very, very close. Um, and these results are just the very beginning of the counting. So we'll make sure to tune in later on those results. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at the Utah Senate debate between Evan McMullen, the independent, and Mike Lee, the incumbent Republican. Uh, Evan McMullen is stepping away from the Republican Party and Donald Trump and trying to take a uh, combined approach. And now we are going to come back to the studio. We'll come back with more numbers later. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much there, Jake. Really cool overview of... Uh, some votes that have just started coming in. Now, to be clear, this is a very small percentage in most of these races uh, of, of different votes that have, have been counted so far. 
in Pennsylvania, you'll probably see that this is, you know, maybe this is around uh, eight, nine, ten percent of the total votes that are actually going to come in. So hard to tell right now, hard to make any predictions as of yet. But over the course of the next three hours, I'm sure we'll get something. We're going to head now to a quick check in with our student meteorologist, Stephen. So, Stephen, what do you got for us weather wise? Well, right now it's calm and pretty nice out there, although it is a bit chilly with a temperature of 47 degrees as of, I have to actually update this, this is as of 8 o'clock, uh, 47 degree temperature, dew point is 16, so it's very dry, nice and calm wind. That does, however, mean that we're going to get a freeze overnight tonight. So if you have plants outside, you definitely want to bring them in. Our weather headlines, a few more warm days are ahead Thursday and Friday before we have a major storm, unfortunately, to deal with Friday night into Saturday. And then the first flakes of the season, they're possible perhaps on Sunday night. And we'll look at that in just a moment as well. Currently, our satellite is pretty much empty across the region, and so is the radar. Here's Danbury right here. So if you live anywhere in the northeast, East, you're not seeing any kind of precipitation and that will continue to be the case for at least the next couple of days. This is a concern though. This is Tropical Storm Nicole and this, if you take a look at the path, it's likely to make landfall in Florida as a hurricane on Thursday and then it's going to be making a beeline right up the coast towards New England and it will hit either directly over the Danbury area or just a bit to our west on Friday evening. Now, it won't be considered a tropical storm at that point, but the impacts here really are going to be pretty similar. So what can we expect on Friday night? Well, one to four inches of rain are possible in addition to wind gusts, potentially 50 miles an hour, maybe a little bit more, especially along the shoreline. And there could definitely be some scattered tree damage and power outages. So a very nasty night coming up Friday night into Saturday. And that will also unfortunately flip the pattern back to what we would more normally expect in November, including some pretty chilly weather. Tonight, It'll be a taste of what we usually see this time of year. We're going all the way down to the mid-20s this evening. A hard freeze is likely, so definitely bring in those plants. And then tomorrow, a seasonably cool day. Sunny skies, but temperatures really not getting very far. We will be only in the middle 50s. We will warm things back up again for Thursday as the mild air returns. Temperatures should be in the mid-60s. Same story for Friday. But then Friday night into Saturday, Tropical Storm Nicole arrives just to our west. It won't be considered a fully tropical storm, but again, and many of the impacts that you would associate with that kind of situation would uh, will still be in play there. Then if we do dry out Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, however, another wave of low pressure arrives this time with showers and maybe even a chance for a snow flurry or uh, very, very late in the overnight Sunday into Monday. No big deal, but some areas could get their first flakes of the season, especially in the higher elevations of Litchfield County. Thank you, everybody, and uh, let's go back to the studio. Yo, my name is Ali and I need a home Please give me a backyard with grass and trees for me to roam I like home digging, water drinking, and cow sitting My favorite dog toy is a Hillary Clinton So on behalf of all dogs, if y'all could help us It's about four million dogs and animal shelters So stay away from your pet shop, son You could save a life if you adopt one My best friend since childhood My mother my child, she was 26 years old. 82 years old. I was 25 when I killed my best friend. I was 56 years old when I killed my mother in a drunk driving accident. I was 35 when I killed my child. Please drink responsibly and drive sober. Don't let the people you love become another statistic. About half the people using public restrooms don't wash their hands. But it's the most effective way to prevent infection. It's simple. Just wash your hands. Get the facts. It's good for you, Connecticut. It's good for all of us. Speech isn't always spoken. Sometimes it's dance. Sometimes it's painted. Sometimes it's written. Sometimes it's all about the style. So I say, what I love to say, what I need to say, what I have the right to say. Speech isn't always spoken. Know your right to express yourself. 
Your sneeze produces 5,000 bacteria-filled droplets, and they can travel 10 feet. So sneeze into your sleeve, and you'll reduce the spread of infection. Get the facts. It's good for you, Connecticut. It's good for all of us. Nation's Finest is a nonprofit that's been dedicated to helping military veterans and their families for nearly 50 years. The COVID-19 crisis has hit homeless and low-income veterans hard. Through the VA Supportive Services for Veteran Families program, Nation's Finest can assist veterans and their families who are struggling to pay rent and other housing-related costs. To get help, visit nationsfinest.org or call 833-GOT-YOUR-6. That's 833-468-9676. Welcome to Election Connection, Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage. I'm Jacob Schultz. This is Election Connection's 12th year, and we are here tonight until midnight with news and issues important to Connecticut. And I'm Alec Riasic. Tonight we're covering national as well as state races, including those races in Fairfield County. Let's go to the board with Jake Nicolari. Jake, make us smarter. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Jacob. Tonight, right now, we're going to go back to CT races and take another look at the races here in Connecticut. Uh, I just want to start off first by talking about the ballot measures. Currently, is it a 54% yes vote? Uh, and this is uh, in trend with the rest of the ballot measure votes that Connecticut has had in the past. Um, now, moving on, we're going to look at the CT governor's race. First, we have uh, Ned Lamont, our incumbent, and he is currently leading Bob Stefanowski by slightly less than 20,000 votes. This is similarly projected to what was projected, uh, but will definitely be worth keeping up with later in the night. Uh, next, we have our guaranteed race. We're just you know, adding our numbers, confirming that Richard Blumenthal has won, but AP has already called this race. Next, we're looking at the 5th Congressional District. This is, once again, that really important race in Connecticut where Johanna Hayes is only slightly leading George Logan right now. Before I came in here, George Logan was actually leading, which proves that this race is just as close as they predicted. Next, we're looking at the 24th Congressional District, and with a lot more of these local races and these uh, state-specific races, it's a lot harder for us to have numbers right now because Associated Press isn't really concerned with our state uh, elections. They're more concerned with the national elections, so we'll be, we'll be sure to update you on these numbers later tonight. Uh, and the same thing with the seat, uh, 26th Congressional District of Connecticut. Uh, we have C.C. Moore and Tony Boucher. Once again, these uh, two candidates are going to be uh, close, and we'll see what happens. Um, Tony Huang and Tim Gavin, once again, similar position of we'll be back later tonight with more on these candidates. Um, in our next position, we have the Congressional District, uh, the 42nd Congressional District, and um, this is going to be uh, similar for the rest of the results and races in and t specific to Connecticut. So we will make sure to come back later tonight to cover more on these races and the races specific to Connecticut. Thank you, and back to you guys in the studio. Well, thanks so much for the update there, Jake. We'll be coming back throughout the night to make sure that we get the most recently updated information, most recently updated numbers for all of our viewers watching. We want to make sure that we are on the money and accurate. We don't want to call anything too early or not update you as is needed. So we're just being careful with any decisions that we make so far, as we do have some mail-in ballots that we need to uh, uh, wait to be counted. We have a lot of polls who, which literally just closed, you know, a few moments ago, maybe an hour ago. So the counting right now is, you know, we're still looking at 9, 10 percent 
for a lot of our especially national level elections uh, and even some state elections here in Connecticut are still not quite uh, ready to even make any sort of uh, decision or inference off of. But for right now, we're going to be taking a look at a, uh, a pretty important issue for Republicans going into this election, something that they've definitely played on a lot, which is rising crime rates. So what we're going to have here is a few graphs. You can see it on the board right there. And pretty much we're looking at the rate of violent victimization and violent victimization reported to police. Now, if we see here in 1993, you can see that that violent crime level is a lot higher, right? Uh, and then as we go throughout the years, we are seeing it now around 2020, 2021, actually decrease significantly, right? It's very interesting to look at these two different lines here. We have the rate of violent victimization and then victimization, which is actually reported to the police. And it's just worth noting that um, we previously, you know, a couple decades ago, we're seeing a large number of violent crimes not actually get reported to the police. It looks like that number has actually gotten a little bit closer now to um, realistic levels of total violent crimes. So something that, you know, might sort of go against, you could say, a lot of the uh, Republican ideas that crime has been on the rise in America um, as, you know, over the course of the last 30 years, obviously there has been a bit of a decrease overall. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not necessarily a concern. A lot of people are still concerned about crime. You know, it's a serious issue. And it also depends drastically where you are. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you're in a rural town, it's not really something you might have to worry mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're in a city, it's a whole different story. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it, it is something that we have, um, you know, to keep a close eye on. And when we look at non-economic issues, according to Gallup polling and, and Pew Research polling, when we look at non-economic issues, we're seeing that crime is usually one of the top two or three issues. It pretty much comes down to abortion, border security, and then we usually see crime be right on top there. Now, one of the issues that comes into focus a little bit when looking at crime is gun violence and gun control, gun rights, how to grapple with all of the different politics and sort of policies that are being discussed in Washington as they relate to gun ownership in America. Gun ownership is something that Americans ha have really used to define their identity for a long time. I know, yes. And now it is now the um, leading cause in teen deaths, um, gun violence and gang violence and stuff like that, over um, car accidents. So that's something that we really have to look at and we have to say, you know what, this is really scary sure. to be dealing with something like that uh, in times like these. Yeah. So. Um, we have to be aware of how we take it. Absolutely. Yeah, and especially here in Connecticut, unfortunately, uh, gun violence is something that we all uh, think about probably every single year on the anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, you know, obviously a terrible tragedy, and it is something that uh, really does beg the question of what, what should be done here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we're going to take After a After all these years later. No, no, it's, it's, it's all right. It's all right. We'll get to the discussion in just a moment. But for right now, we're going to take a look at a brief story here um, about gun violence from Moms Demand Action. So let's hear what they have to say. So why is this election important to dealing with gun violence? Well, every election is important to dealing with gun violence from the local municipal elections to city city elections to state elections to federal elections every single every single election is an opportunity to strengthen um support for for um, common sense gun legislation um so this particular one um is resonant for us because right after sandy hook gun gun control or or gun violence prevention was we couldn't even talk about it nobody would touch the topic for for any platform but now we have advanced to the point 10 years later that it is actually a winning platform for candidates and they are, are want to go on record saying that they will support stronger gun laws to keep our community safe Moms Demand Action actually has a program called um, Gun Sense Candidates, and they are uh, they can um, apply and be named by, based on the, a survey, um, a Gun Sense Candidate of Distinction. 
And that is a signal to the 8 million moms demand action supporters across the country um, that these are the candidates that they should be voting for. We are nonpartisan. Um, we, it, you can be a Republican or a Democrat or independent and get the gun sense candidate distinction. Um, so we are, what we really are working towards is safer communities, keeping our children and our places of worship and our malls and our movie theaters and our schools safe. Now, this has been a contentious and partisan year and education has become a hot topic for many voters. So we caught up with WCSU's president, Dr. Paul Barron, and Governor Ned Lamont, Bob Stefanowski, to take a look on basically what the future looks like for education in Connecticut. Here we have a special interview with interim president of Western Connecticut State University, uh, president Barron, thanks so much for joining us. We're really, really happy to have you here. I'm definitely excited, uh, so thank you. Well, it's a pleasure be, to be here. Is, is school for everyone? Is, is this, is university, high school, anything like that, should that be the kind of thing that students are impassioned about right now? Do you think that it, it fits everyone's sort of goals and paths in life? Well, I'm gonna say that learning is for everyone. Sure. Now, how that happens can yeah. vary in a whole variety of different ways. Okay. So I think that one of the things that I see happening is, um, particularly at the, at the public school level, I think that more and more schools are trying to be interactive with students. I think more schools are, are integrating, uh, just like Danbury is, uh, uh, you know, they're creating a whole high school that's kind of a parallel high school to, to teach specific skill sets and specific uh, job trades, things like that. So it's all about learning. Sure. So I think, that, <clears throat> I think that when school becomes rote memorization, uh, worksheets, uh, and those kinds of things, I, I think that learning's not really going on. Right. Learning is about, is about problem solving. It's about um, uh, critical thinking. It's about learning how to make decisions sure, and how to deal with the complexities that make decision making important as the older you, that you get. Absolutely, of course. So should we push forward the idea for high school seniors that there are options <clears throat> outside of college? I think it depends on the senior. I think it, right. it depends on the family, it depends on what their goals are depends how they like to learn sure um, I, I was a uh, for many years i worked as a uh, professor in a community college working with students who had who were mainstreaming into a variety of different different areas but a lot of them were going into job fields right so it's the same way in high school you know so if if students students might feel more comfortable um with three-dimensional learning, like what happens in a mechanical situation or a cooking situation uh, or um, a, a hands-on kinds of environment, as opposed to the environment where you might figure out a quadratic equation or, right. um, uh, or, or write a paper. I think that students need to follow, and, and, and parents, I hope, help students follow a path that leads them to the best way that they learn and the best way that and which which will lead them to to careers and things to do in life that are fulfilling and meaningful for them we have some difficulties facing schools nationwide whether they be high schools colleges and you know we're seeing some uh, almost record levels of dropouts right we're seeing schools have to drop courses things like that how do we help schools combat some of these issues? Well, there's a, there's a national trend going on right now in higher education and specifically, uh, and students are seeing, um, they're, de they're deciding whether or not college is worth it or not. Right. And that's something that each individual student has to decide. But I, I think ultimately, the difficulty that we have is making sure that the subjects that we teach have some kind of connection to the real world. 
Sure. And I'm not saying, and I'm not talking about coming to college just to learn a job skill like plumbing or like being an electrician or something like that. I'm talking about um, a job skill that has might have to do with communication or mathematical ability or right. or uh, 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 finding uh, logical paths, uh, pathways of thinking. All those things are job skill related. And, right. and I think that sometimes we don't do as good of a job as we need to in connecting the, the academic subjects to why they're useful and why you need them. Some students are just in a, in a, in a mode of inquiry. Right. And they just want to know, and, and they love to read, and they love to, you know, they are, they are really students in a pure sense. Sure. You know, they're just after knowledge, and, and I think that's a beautiful thing. <clears throat> but many students need a connection to why do I need this? What am I going to do with this? How am I going to use this? And I think sometimes we tend to ignore the fact that we need to have some answers for that. Absolutely. And I would say that, you know, things like the liberal arts that maybe don't have a specific path sure. to a degree, to, to, a, to a job. But what we don't want to do is make sure that we don't ignore those or, or diminish those because those are the courses where people really right. learn how to think. Sure. And they really learn how to solve problems, which is applicable to any workplace situation. Absolutely. Uh, having two English degrees, I can assure you that I use yeah. those thinking skills <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and uh, I think that that's something that students can look forward to. So thanks so much for joining us here, Dr. Barron. Uh, we are Really honored to have you. Uh, it's been a great conversation. And uh, we'd love to have you back sometime for a longer interview, all right? I'd, I'd love to do that. Thank you for asking me. Of course. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us. I'm Jacob Schultz, and I'm here with an exclusive interview with Evan Walker from WXCI 91.7 FM, our school's radio station. Thanks so much for joining us, Evan. Thanks so much for having me on Election Connection. Of course. I'd like to congratulate WXCI on their 50th anniversary, 50 years. Wow. 50 years of great music and great interviews, all thanks to our amazing listeners. Absolutely. Well, we've been pleasured to work in collaboration with WXCI for the past several years now. I believe it's been 11 years. Is that right? Yep, 11 years. And we always get to do great things with Election Connection. So thank you so much. Of course. It's, it's uh, really great to work together. So you had the pleasure of interviewing a few of our state's candidates for various petitions. Uh, you asked Governor Ned Lamont and Republican challenger Bob Stefanowski about higher education. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Great. So how did you go about getting these interviews? Yeah, so my co-host Nico Bass has a lot of political connections, and we were able to use those. Uh, all these were able to happen because of him, and you know, I'd like to thank him for that. A lot of you know, long phone calls to get these interviews. Sure. Now, what was it like to work with these candidates? Well, these candidates, their schedule changes every single day, and so it's hard to keep track sometimes. You know, we had to reschedule a few times, but they've been a pleasure to work with utmost amazing professionals. Sure. Now, you also interviewed Johanna Hayes, right? What was it like to work with her? So, Congresswoman Hayes, I gave her a phone call one day, and she just wanted to come in in person right away, full hour, and it was amazing to work with her, and her staff is so amazing to work with. Wow, that's great. So, what were the takeaways from interviewing these different candidates? Well, my takeaways from this were that uh, they were both well-informed and they were able to answer my questions very well and that this is going to be, you know, uh, I, that's a close race, I got to tell you. It, it's, as of right now, looking to be surprisingly close, especially the uh, Hayes-Logan race, for sure. Yeah. Um, so definitely excited to see the results tonight, but thanks so much for joining us, Evan. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, would you support increased funding for higher education because some of our CSUs uh, are struggling financially? Well, we've given um, um, hundreds of millions of additional money to our colleges, including a CSU. I think um, Western got about 12 million anyway. Um, I, I would say two things. Use this money to be innovative. Use this money to create programs that become self-sustaining. You know, think about um, the incredible jobs in the greater Danbury area. They are very short of uh, trained workers. So be, a, be that Lind, be that Beringer Ingelheim, be that um, Danbury Hospital. I would really urge um, 
Western in this case, to be talking to them and find out what is the basic um, education folks need so they'll be productive members so you can guarantee a job for people there. Then over time, they'll get more involved as well. We have, um, I'll, I'll tell you, Evan, um, Connecticut is one of the great um, education systems in the world. I mean, that's our strength. Um, you know, you can, Texas has oil and Florida resells sunshine to tourists. <laughs> we can't do that. But we do have the best trained uh, workers in the world because we have the best education system in the world. Western's a big piece of that. So make sure you're training people for the jobs that are out there. Uh, you also need people with a liberal arts background who continue to think and learn. So remember um, how broad education is. It's about learning a skill, but it's also about being able to learn the next skills uh, as the world changes. How do you plan on supporting current public schools and future ones in Connecticut? So I'm a product of the public schools. I, I graduated from North Haven High School. I think we need to certainly invest in our schools. I believe that education funding should follow the child and, and let the parents make the decision that's best for their kids. That does not mean abandoning the, the city schools. Um, we need to make sure that they're resourced for people that want to stay. Uh, but I'm a big believer in charter schools, magnet schools, technical schools. Um, there's a lot we can do. You may have seen the data that um, um, New Haven, the proficiency level in, in math right now is 20%. COVID really set us back in terms of kids' education. And, and I think we need to use some of the massive surplus we have, the $6 billion surplus, I think we need to, 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 to form some programs to catch kids up, um, after school programs, um, parental adult education programs at night. And there's, there's a lot we can do, and I, I look forward to getting into office to do it. Thank you so much, Mr. Stefanowski. Well, now let's go to an update from our field reporter, Ryan, to hear from him about how things are looking. So, Ryan, how's everything going out there? Ryan, can you hear me? Ryan, can you? Hello? Oh, we, we got you now, Ryan. No worries. We had a little audio issue there for a moment. Me? Yeah, we got you. We got you. Okay. The vibes are really good here. As you might be able to tell, the music is quite loud, so bear with me as I try and work through this. But obviously, as we knew earlier in the night, the race was called for Blumenthal, and Blumenthal actually came out here and gave a speech with Chris Murphy preface, uh, prefacing it. And they basically just talked about the Democrats' successes, the importance of protecting our democracy, especially during this election, and how such a victory like this would affect that and how big this is for the Democratic Party. We are expecting later on into the night um, Lamont to come out and make a speech, whether that'll be a victory speech or a concession. We'll see as the numbers roll in. Obviously, the poll numbers are looking very good, and people are expecting it's going to continue to be a great night here. Great. Well, thank you for the update, Ryan. I really appreciate that. Um, seems like there's a lot of energy there. Seems like the Democrats are celebrating accordingly. Uh, so that's that's really awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jacob. Of course. Well, it seems as if the Connecticut Democrats are carrying a little bit more energy than a lot of uh, uh, critics, I guess you could say, thought they might have going into this election, purely based on the fact how close certain poll numbers were, right? Yes. We were seeing uh, uh, some very tight races, and races still are tight. You know, I, I can't deny that, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, we're seeing, you know, still uh, not even close to calling the uh, Johanna Hayes yeah, versus no. uh, George Logan race. Yeah, no, not close right? at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of Connecticut races, which we need to take a look at, let's go to a quick story regarding Michelle Coelho and uh, Julie Kushner and some of uh, their differences between the two. So let's take a look. I am a very strong advocate for individual rights. I was able to, um, with the support of the Danbury Board of Ed, have that mass mandate lifted. I'm an advocate for our safeguarding our children's education with social and emotional learning and uh, making sure that uh, CRT is not implemented in our schools. We were able to begin a curriculum committee, um, which we have not had in place for some time. 
I am also endorsed by the Independent Party, as well as the Fraternal Order of Police, which is a very big honor for me. I um, First thing I would do is uh, repeal the uh, anti-police bill and make sure that we give respect and tools back to our police so that they can do the job and uh, reduce crime that's already here. I know what communism is. I saw it happen 30 years ago, and it is here. Uh, my opponent accepted the communist award for the uh, $15 an hour um, <laughs> salary, and um, I am, my vote matters to your values, so I'm asking for your uh, support and to make sure that we keep our liberties and our freedoms here in America. In 2019, when I first stepped into the legislature, I was assigned the task of leading the passage of the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. And I gotta tell you, it was the most proud thing I've done. Since January, when we started paying out benefits, we have paid out benefits to 29,000 working families. We paid out $140 million in benefits. This is something that was essential. It's, it's a big program, and it's solving big problems with big solutions, and that's something I'm very proud of. There are many things that we've done in the legislature that address the big issues. We banned the use of single-use plastic bags, something that will help our environment, and there's so much more we have to do on that issue. We accelerated the funding of our public schools. I'd like to see us do more on funding our public schools. We paid down our long-term debt, essential. We've done the big things, and we've done some things just for the district. I was really proud to get a $2 million bond to build a garage in Danbury. Now, why would that be important? Because that garage will serve as the foundation for 80 units of senior housing. I'm very proud of that. It's something we need. So there are things you do listening to your voters, listening to your constituents for individuals, and you do the big things and the little things, but there's so much more we have to do. I'm proud to serve as the chair of the Indoor Air Quality and Public Schools Working Group. I want to see us tackle that big issue next. I also served on the task force to help firefighters deal with cancer. I want to see us take that further. I am honored and privileged to be the senator for the 24th district. I love the people of the 24th district. I love the work. I'm totally accessible. I work hard. I want to continue to do that. Well. Some very interesting statements there from both of our candidates, uh, Michelle Coelho and uh, Julie Kushner. And I have to say, as someone who attended that candidate forum, you just saw some clips of different stark differences between the two. Uh, a lot of fun that forum was. But uh, yeah, definitely two very different candidates. Not a whole lot they agree upon. It I seems say. like the only two things that they do agree on is the uh, Referendum Act and as well as uh, improving uh, schools, public schools. And that... That's about it. <laughs> right, and those are pretty safe, nonpartisan yeah, issues. Exactly. Um, but before we get too in depth to that, let's just hear a quick commentary from our student meteorologist, Stephen. So, Stephen, how's the weather looking? Well, it looks nice for the next couple of days anyway, and then once we get into the weekend, we will start to have a bit more problems. But right now, as of 9 o'clock, we have a temperature of 41 degrees in Danbury, a dew point of 21, so it's very dry out there, and some light wind out of the north at 3 miles an hour. For our headlines, we will have a few more days that are warm, not tomorrow, but Thursday and Friday do look pretty mild, before we will be dealing with, unfortunately, a major storm Friday night into Saturday. We'll get to that in a minute, as well as when we might just see our first snowflakes of the season. Our satellite is completely clear over the Connecticut area right now, and our radar shows that anywhere in the northeast that you are is bone dry. So nothing to worry about tonight, nothing to worry about tomorrow, and in fact, nothing to worry about on Thursday either. It's Friday night that we're concerned about thanks to this, Tropical Storm Nicole. It's going to be moving off to the west. It will hit Florida on Thursday as a Category 1 hurricane and then move off towards the north and eventually pass either just west of or even directly over the Danbury area in the overnight hours of Friday night into Saturday. Now, it won't be a tropical storm at that point officially, but the conditions that we could be dealing with Friday night, in fact, will look and feel 
uh, pretty similar to what we would expect from a tropical type system. So what can we expect? Well, one to four inches of rain are possible uh, Friday night into Saturday morning, along with wind gusts up to 50, maybe a little bit higher than that, especially on the shoreline. And yeah, there could be a bit of uh, a scattered tree and power issues, but I think that we're fortunate in the sense that this is coming in November when we don't really have those leaves on the trees anymore. If this was a month ago, I'd be a lot more concerned about power outages, but we should dodge the worst of it thanks to that. So our forecast for tonight, we're going with a low of 25 degrees. It'll be mostly clear. The winds will be light, which means that we will be dealing with a hard freeze. So certainly if you have any plants out there tonight, you absolutely must cover them up if you want them to survive. And then Wednesday, tomorrow, 54 degrees, sunny and seasonably cool out there. We've, it'll feel pretty... It'll feel a lot colder than that, though, just because, well, it's been so warm out recently. And that's a trend that will continue, in fact, on to Thursday as the mild air returns and temperatures go back into the mid-60s. Unfortunately, though, by Friday, yes, it's warm, but by Friday afternoon, that rain moves in in association with Nicole, and we can expect heavy rain and strong wind late Friday afternoon into Saturday morning. We dry things out by the afternoon. It stays dry for about 24 hours, and then a new system arrives Sunday afternoon with some showers and potentially at the very tail end, a few snowflakes mixed in, uh, especially across the higher elevations of Litchfield County on Sunday night. So just a chance that we see our first flakes of the season in the not terribly distant future, uh, Jake and Alec. So much for the update there, Stephen. I really do appreciate it. It's always good to know what's going on weather-wise, and uh, it's good to take a take a brief break from all the political discussion, you know, to uh, sort of see what's going on around us. But uh, we've got a, a quick package here, quick story for you for uh, pretty much going over a campaign ad ran by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. So let's take a look at that. That has this has been polarizing to many people. It's quite interesting. Let's see it. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a protector. So God made a fighter. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, kiss his family goodbye, travel thousands of miles for no other reason than to serve the people to save their jobs, their livelihoods, their liberty, their happiness. So God made a fighter. God said, I need someone to be strong, advocate truth in the midst of hysteria, someone who challenges conventional wisdom and isn't afraid to defend what he knows to be right and just. So God made a fighter. God said, I need somebody who will take the arrows Stand firm in the wake of unrelenting attacks. Look a mother in the eyes and tell her that her child will be in school. She can keep her job, go to church, eat dinner with friends, and hold the hand of an aging parent taking their breath for the last time. So God made a fighter. God said, I need a family man. A man who would laugh and then sigh and then reply with smiling eyes when his daughter says she wants to spend her life doing what dad does. So God made a fighter. So very interesting campaign ad there from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who has actually been called to winning uh, the governorship. It's been called that he, he has won that race uh, as governor. He'll be serving another term uh, as governor of Florida, which was not necessarily unexpected. But it seems to me that he's won by a pretty large margin at this point. Uh, obviously, we don't have exact vote counts yet or exact percentage counts as of this moment. But um, he seems to be pulling ahead. So and he also has his eye on uh, the 2024 election coming up. We'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to see how exactly his, uh, his second term as governor might impact any 2024 hopes. But he seems to me like the likely candidate, likely choice for the Republican Party uh, if they choose to take an even further step away from 
former President Trump, which might be the case. There's a lot of Republicans who really seem to want to shift away from Trump and try something a little bit different. Yes, yes. This is also a candidate who has um, supported school choice mm -hmm. and as well as uh, school vouchers and uh, public funding. Um, these give him these give him and uh, parents of kids the right to use whatever uh, money they put aside for their children and use whatever curriculum they want to use uh, specifically for their child. And I feel like this is now um, supposedly going away from um, the right side. Supposedly, I feel like it is taking himself and putting himself kind of in the middle, seeing what parents want to do with their children. Uh, unlike following the agenda that the right has for him. Right. And it's, it's interesting to me as we're about to, uh, we're about to hear from a, uh, a quick story. Our next story we'll be going into uh, momentarily. Um, school choice and what kids are being taught in school specifically seems to be something that is really resounding yes. with a lot of Americans. A lot of American parents <laughs> are concerned about what their kids are being taught in the classroom. And it's something that... Um, I think is understandable, mm -hmm. and DeSantis has done a very good job of grasping that. You Do you know? think that um, him uh, uh, putting these rules in um, of letting parents choose what they want their kids to learn? Do you think that helps kids uh, further down the line, or do you think it harms children further down the line? Well, I think it depends what exactly they're learning right. versus not learning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think being taught, you know, math in school is great. Yes. I think certain issues really do need to be kept. Um, to a minimum. Do you think we're ever going to see a country that um, um, parents have so much power that their kids don't have to learn math or science or uh, certain English? Um, well, you know, I, I think it's, it is possible. Uh, and, and, you know, parents do have the choice if they want to send their children uh, to a different school system. They, they can do that depending mm -hmm. on what they're able to afford and, and, you know, different variables like that. So, yeah, I think it's possible that you might see a lot of parents say, you know what, maybe you don't need to learn this and maybe you can head more towards a trade school or something like that, you know, um, or vice versa. So I think I think it is possible. And um, though some people would disagree that that's not necessarily the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And I do agree that there, there have to be some, you know, statewide standards that people, uh, children should have to pass. Um, I think this has uh, this has less to do with, you know, what's being taken out of the classroom yeah. and more to do with just not putting in more things that have only really been suggested within the last couple of years. But just to take a brief break from that conversation, we're going to head to our field reporter, Tyler Bowe. Tyler, how's everything looking? Yeah, Jacob. So we're just here outside the Republican headquarters for George Logan. He's currently not here. He's in uh, Trumbull uh, with his campaign managers. Uh, however, I just wanted to quickly update the audience and you guys about some of the latest numbers that I've seen come in. Right now, Johanna Hayes is roughly 2,400 votes ahead of George Logan. And as you know, I was at a, uh, the headquarters of Johanna Hayes uh, previously, so that optimism seems to be working so far. However, there's still a lot of votes to be casted. Absolutely. It, it definitely seems like it might still be a, a bit too early to make any notable predictions. Now, Tyler, could you tell me briefly, um, are you in any way aware of the percentage of votes that's been counted yet? Are we looking at 20% reporting, 40%, 50%? If you're not sure, it's totally fine because I know different sources are saying different things. Right. So the latest thing that I've seen so far was only around 12 to 15 percent reporting. So like you mentioned, still a lot of uh, votes to come in. So way too early to call. Sure. Well, we got a lot of votes coming in and uh, a lot of, you know, different things that are going to be very close. We, we did see pretty much all polls predicting that the Logan v. Hayes race was going to be incredibly close. We're talking margins less than even a whole percentage point. Yeah. So it's going to be a close one. It's going to be very cool to see how it ends up. But, um, yeah, thank you for the information, uh, Tyler, and, and we'll come back to you later throughout the evening. Thank you. All right, I'll keep you up at it. Thank you, Jacob. Of course. Well, we're seeing uh, Hayes perhaps pull ahead in her election, though I have to say it is too early to count. And 2,400 votes? 
is yes. not that much. It's not too much. Not a large margin. Yes. No, not 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 at all. And it is something that uh, you know I think the Democrats are going to have to be going uh, going ahead. They're going to have to be aware of this mm -hmm. because you know Hayes is, is a candidate. She's the incumbent. She's been doing this for a while. Okay. You would think that in a Democratic stronghold like Connecticut, mm -hmm. she would really not have any problems. Yeah. Um, but George Logan, with some of his unique policy prescriptions, being a little bit more relaxed on things like abortions than the uh, uh, traditional Republican view, I think he's actually successfully, well, we'll have to see how successfully, but uh, uh, some of the predictions going into this election uh, were showing that he may have successfully brought some moderates to the Republican ballot, um, which is not easy to do. No. So interesting strategy, and honestly one that I think you'll probably see the Republican Party be split a little bit more on moving into the next couple of years here. We'll probably see some Republicans really go heavy after Trump, right? They Absolutely. want they want 2016 back, Absolutely. right? That's that's that's, and then you're going to see the other side of them say, mm -hmm. you know what, we want something different. As you have your election deniers who really want that back, yes, yes, for sure, for sure. And uh, speaking of, of something that has been polarizing Americans recently and uh, really pushed us further away from one another, was obviously the COVID-19 pandemic, right? We had a lot of different opinions regarding that. Uh, uh, vaccination, you know, different measures. And during that time period, something that a lot of Americans took solace in uh, was cryptocurrency and NFTs and things of, of that nature mm -hmm. because a lot of people were losing their jobs, yep. right? A lot of people were struggling financially. And now um, we're kind of seeing the fallout from that. Uh, so we're going to take a look now at cryptocurrency, NFTs, and uh, dive a little bit into that story. So let's take a look. Analysts estimate that the global cryptocurrency market will more than triple by 2030, hitting nearly $5 billion. You may have already heard of currencies such as Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and Ethereum. But what is crypto? A cryptocurrency is a digital or virtual currency that is secured by cryptography, which makes it nearly impossible to counterfeit or double spend. This market has been an attractive area of investment for the younger generation. Its growth has been so rapid that it has made its way into many people's investment portfolios and forced its way into the world of politics. We asked WCSU students if they had any idea what cryptocurrency was. Matt, do you know what crypto is? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. As the popularity of crypto grows more and more, crypto companies see the potential in getting young voters to register to vote and having them vote for candidates who support crypto. Here's a clip from crypto talk show Coindesk talking about Coinbase's new focus. Yesterday, Coinbase launched a voter registration tool ahead of November's elections. So Chief Policy Officer Faryar Shirzad tweeted that the leaders elected in this year's elections will be the ones making critical decisions about the future of crypto, blockchain, and Web3, and about your economic freedom. And are you aware that you could register to vote through Coinbase this year? I I did not know that. I did not know that, but now I know. Governor Ned Lamont has been working closely with the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development to create a $5 million grant to help bring the digital currency group to Connecticut. They are a leading investor in Bitcoin and blockchain technology companies. Lamont has informed his administration that the company will be relocating its headquarters from New York City to Stamford, Connecticut. The company is expected to create more than 300 jobs in Connecticut over the next five years. Governor Lamont was quoted in saying, Digital Currency Group's decision to relocate their headquarters here is the latest example of how Connecticut is the ideal location for leading edge companies that are focused on business growth. This is Tyler Bowe, WCSU News, Election Connection. You're watching Election Connection, Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage. We're discussing national and state races, including those races in Fairfield County. Let's go to the board with Jake Nicolari to get an update on how constituents of Connecticut are voting. Jake, make us smarter. Well, Alec and Jake, first we're going to take a look at out-of-state races. When we come back at the top of the hour, we will get back to how CT is voting. But right now we're going to look out-of-state to figure out how the Senate is going to be made up this year. Uh, in Arizona, 
quickly after this hour. If you stay tuned, we will come back with results from Arizona. Those are coming later tonight. Uh, right now, we're looking at Georgia. They are counting fast in Georgia. They've got already almost 2 million votes counted for, uh, between Warnock and Walker. Uh, this race is similar to the predictions, one of the closest races that we're looking at right now, as you can see, we're only about 5,000 votes difference between the two candidates. And that is going to make Georgia super important to keep up with tonight. We'll move on to Nevada, just like Arizona. We'll come back to those results later in the night. Uh, we have New Hampshire, where Maggie Hassan is leading Don Bullock, much like uh, predicted. She is not... Uh, she does not have a guaranteed win right now. This is only about with 20% of the vote counted, but this does indicate that she might have a chance at holding onto her seat. Um, in Ohio, we see, uh, once again, Fast County. It's these key uh, state seats that are being counted faster. We want to make sure that we know who has the Senate majority. And um, much like predictions uh, with J.D. Vance uh, just getting ahead before Election Day, we are now seeing uh, the results of the Election uh, Day votes being counted. And that's why we see J.D. Vance right here actually leading uh, in front of Tim Ryan, who earlier, when I was reporting, was in lead. So this would be more interesting to come back to later tonight. Um, in Pennsylvania, we're currently looking at a lead for Fetterman. It's a pretty good lead, but keep in mind that Pennsylvania does a lot of early and mail-in voting, which is majority Democrat. So this lead is nothing to guarantee Fetterman the win and is definitely um, going to keep our eyes on the Pennsylvania race tonight. We're going to move on to look at the Utah Senate race. This Senate race, much like Arizona and Nevada, will be coming out very shortly, so we will make sure to update you later tonight with more results. Um, but this race will probably be pretty close, much like predicted. Um, and then finally, in Wisconsin, we're looking at uh, incumbent Ron Johnson, who has historically held on to his seat, but this year it is challenged by Mandela Barnes, who is actually currently predicted uh, he's, he's ahead of Ron Johnson, which could really say something for Democrats who are scared that they might lose their seat in some of these key states. Um, and finally, uh, later tonight, we will be looking at Washington because this race has been uh, getting narrower and narrower as we move closer to Election Day. So this race later tonight might become very important, much like these other races. Um, but that is all for the out-of-state races right now. Back to you guys in the studio. Well, thank you so much for the update there, Jake. Really do appreciate it. Um, and it's interesting to see how a lot of these races are, as more numbers come in, we're seeing the gap close a little bit. And that's probably a trend that we're going to see happen throughout the evening, especially in states like Pennsylvania, where initially there was a huge gap between yeah. the two. Now, Jake, I, uh, I'm at a loss for words. See, Herschel Walker, uh, 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 running for Georgia, running for senator, I don't know how this man is so close in the numbers, man. I, I don't understand. He... He uh, faked being an FBI agent. He claimed that he was a part of all these um, various food chains and that he owned that he didn't. He said that he was a sheriff in one of the counties that uh, he used to live in. And they're all not true. And yet he's tied, basically. He is definitely very close in the polls, mm -hmm. which I think is surprising uh, for a lot of people. So, yeah, well, we'll have to see what, what happens in Georgia. I think due to Herschel Walker being African-American, I think that draws some voters to his side that might traditionally vote Democrat. Mm. And uh, I think that's part of why we're seeing this uh, uh, surprise uh, uh, closeness between the two candidates. Do you think that the, the fact that he is a, uh, mm, not Hall of Famer, but uh, close to Hall of Fame running back, do you think that's that helps voters, that makes them get a little bit jumpy and giddy on, hey, I want to vote for this yes. guy. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I would say it definitely makes his name more recognizable on the ballot. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely think that, that helps at all. Mm. But so right now we're going to head to uh, our, our field reporter, uh, Jimmy. We're going to be hearing some updates from him. Jimmy, how's everything looking? Yeah, Jacob. So I just had a chance to talk with the people over in the Democratic headquarters in Danbury. And 
the vibe in there is still very tense. I mean, votes are still coming in, and we had a chance to talk to a few people, no no politicians, but just some supporters, and they were they were all seeming very tense, very tense. They're not too sure how the night is going to turn out. Um, it was very warm in there. It's cold out here. They had tapas in there. They were eating. They were still having a good time, but the the energy is still very mute. Not no excitement per se, but a lot of, a lot of stale faces and some optimism. Some optimism for sure. Interesting. Well, here that there's optimism is definitely uh, good from a democratic perspective. Now, what I have to ask is, um, obviously, when we compare you know these two candidates here. There, there's a lot of contention between the two, Jimmy. Um, do you think that maybe the Democrats are a little bit worried that the Republicans might pull ahead ever so slightly? Obviously, it's going to be close, but do you, do you get the, the sense that maybe they're a little anxious, they're a little concerned, or does it seem like they're confident, we got this, it's in the bag? I think that there definitely is some confidence for Kushner's camp. Um, maybe the other camps across the state, there's a little bit of um, wariness. But for Kushner in, in her 24th Senate district that I've been reporting on um, all day, it, there seems to be quite a bit of confidence there. Um, there was also at the, um, the headquarters, they had mentioned to me that there was a slight technical issue um, with one of the ballots at one of the wards at one of the high schools, I believe, one of the schools, middle school, high school, I'm not too sure, but it was having trouble counting the um, early votes. So that was also putting a little bit of a stalemate on votes that are coming in. And it seems that they're gonna be coming in slow tonight for this district. Well, I have to say that's a bit concerning uh, that we're seeing voting machines having errors like this because this is not the, pl the, the first time that we've heard of this tonight. You know, we've heard that uh, in certain wow. areas in, in Arizona and Pennsylvania that they also are having trouble with the voting machines. So I really do hope that they can get everything figured out, count every single vote properly, and move forward and give us some, uh, some concise numbers. Because I think we're all waiting for it, right? Of course, of course. And they're all waiting for it, too, in there. They're really excited. They want, they want to celebrate. There's a lot of, a lot of tension, like I mentioned. They, they're just waiting to burst out and be excited about their candidates. Sure, I can imagine, I don't blame them. Well, thanks so much, Jimmy, for the update. Really appreciate it, and uh, we'll come back to you a bit later, all right? Thank you, Jacob. Of course. Well, so interesting to see that the Democrats are sitting on the edge of their seat a little bit there, yeah. anxiously waiting for an announcement, hoping, understandably so, that their candidates will come out on top. Though I will say that Julie Kushner does seem to be pulling ahead a little bit when compared to Michelle Coelho as the incumbent, and she has been obviously doing a lot for Connecticut yes, she has. Uh, and for her district, I, I would say that the polling numbers we saw prior to the election were probably correct in terms of uh, uh, the voting split mm -hmm. that we ended up seeing. Uh, but obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll have to uh, be aware of that because voting machines going on and offline is a bit of a... Especially uh, so close to home. Yeah. It's, yeah. Bit of a problem, bit of a problem. But so we're going to be hearing briefly from our student meteorologist, Stephen, who will give us a quick update on the weather. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing well. And actually, I was just getting a look at some new data regarding Tropical Storm Nicole. And the trend seems to be for it to move a little bit further to the west. I'll talk about what that could mean in just a bit. Uh, but first, let's get a look at the current conditions. As of 9 o'clock, we have a temperature of 41 degrees, 21 degree dew point, 45 percent humidity. So it is dry out there and very light winds out of the north. And as you just saw, uh, my headlines, a few more days of warmth. And then, yeah, we do have to deal with Nicole. Friday night into Saturday and then yeah maybe the chance of a few snowflakes Sunday night into Monday and we'll look at that in just a moment first though I'll show you the current conditions in terms of satellite and radar here's our satellite and well this will be real quick nothing there nothing here no rain or clouds pretty much anywhere in the northeast so a very clear night tonight and that's going to let it get quite cold as well I want to bring your attention now to tropical storm Nicole and this will continue to move across Florida, but like I said right now, a lot of the models now kind of on this western edge of it. So the track now looks to be maybe more towards central New York as opposed to directly over the Danbury area. As a general rule, what that would mean for our area would be a bit less rain and perhaps a bit more wind. Uh, that's what we usually see when, when tropical systems or what 
remnants there are of them pass off to our west. So one to four inches of rain right now, I would be leaning more towards that one inch just because of that shift in track a little bit there. Uh, the wind gusts 50 plus still definitely on the table, especially on the shoreline. And there could definitely still be some scattered tree and power damage, although the threat certainly is not as big as it would have been had this happened when we still had leaves on the trees about a month ago. So in terms of that, the timing of this system works in our favor. But for tonight, we don't have to worry about any of that. We have a calm and clear night, uh, 25 degrees, our low temperature with a hard freeze expected. So definitely put some sort of cover on those plants because they won't survive temperatures uh, that cold, clearly. And then tomorrow, we're back to a more seasonable kind of weather for November with a temperature in the mid 50s. And that will feel a lot colder considering some of the really warm temperatures we've had recently. But it's still about what we where we should be for this summer time of the year. Now for our extended forecast, mild air will return to the area on Thursday when we expect temperatures in the mid 60s and sunny skies. Friday starts out all right, but then in the afternoon it's warm as well. But then in the afternoon, uh, what's left of Tropical Storm Nicole will move off to our west and that will introduce the threat of some heavy rain and strong wind. So Friday night, if you have plans, it's really not looking too good right now. The good news is that we do dry things out by Saturday afternoon. We're dry for about 24 hours and then a new system moves in Sunday afternoon and that system could end as a little bit of snow perhaps in the Litchfield Hills in particular, Sunday night into Monday. Now, no accumulation or anything like that, but for many people, it could be their first chance to see snow this winter. So it's uh, not a great forecast, but uh, there are some highlights to enjoy over the next few days. So overall, not the worst thing that could happen either. Back to you, Jacob and Alec. Great. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for the update there on the weather. Obviously something that we all want to keep in mind of moving into any weekend plans that we might have. Let's check out our next story, the Don't Say Gay Bill coming out of Florida. Let's take a look. Among a surge of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation across the country, Florida's legislators voted in March to ban the discussion of gender identity and sexuality in schools from kindergarten to third grade. The bill is being dubbed by its opponents as the Don't Say Gay Bill. In addition to the restrictions on curriculum and discussion, the bill also gives parents the option to sue the school district policy if they feel the policy is violated. According to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, the bill is designed to ensure that parents, rather than teachers, should be choosing how to introduce topics like sexual and gender orientation with their children. We will continue to recognize that in the state of Florida, parents have a fundamental role in the education, health care, and well-being of their children. The president of the Florida Education Association, Andrew Sparr, stated that this bill is based on a falsehood. And that falsehood is that somehow we're teaching kids inappropriate topics at an early age, and clearly we're not. This bill, however, is just the tip of the iceberg with a record amount of anti-LGBTQ bills introduced across the country. When talking about the larger anti-gay conservative agenda in Don't Say Gay, we interviewed political science professor Dr. Howell Williams. It's me. So there's a there's we've seen a kind of resurgence of this idea that like bashing LGBT people can be politically beneficial for the Republican Party. And so when I think of the don't say gay stuff coming out of Florida, it seems to me part of a larger political project to redeploy culture war issues as a way to energize their base. According to activists, by restricting the expression and discussion of gender and sexual orientation creates more hostile and less accepting environments for LGBTQ youth. Welcome to Election Connection, Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage for 2022. I'm Jacob Schultz. This is Election Connection's 12th year, and we are here tonight until midnight with news and issues important to Connecticut. And I'm Alec Riasic. Tonight we're covering national as well as state races. 
Let's go to the board with Jake Nicolari to, for an update. Jake, make us smarter. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Jacob. Right now, we're going to be looking at races in Connecticut. We're going to be looking at the state, the House. We're going to look at ballot measures. Ballot measures this year are for early voting and currently is at about 60% yes, 40% uh, no, which is a pretty good indication that we will get uh, a caucus on early voting later this uh, into early next year. Um, the first race that we're going to look at in Connecticut is the governor's race. This still has not been decided, but Ned Lamont is leading Bob Stefanowski by about 30,000 votes. This is a good lead for him, but Connecticut, like we have talked about previously, is kind of slow in their counting this year. Um, so we'll keep up with this race later into the night. Our next race is going to be the Senate race, which we talked about was already decided uh, for Richard Blumenthal, the winner. Uh, but we're just continuing to get some of those numbers, and we want to update you. So we've got about 157,000 votes for Richard Blumenthal and about 124 for Leora Levy. Um, but this is still, you know, guaranteed for Richard Blumenthal. Uh, next, we're looking at the 5th Congressional District. This district is so close and has been teetering between uh, Logan and Hayes. Currently, Hayes is ahead uh, by about three, a little 2,000 votes. Um, this race will be super important to decide if a uh, Republican is actually going to be holding uh, office in uh, the U.S. House uh, from Connecticut. It's for the first time in a while. Um, and we're still missing some of these numbers for our local uh, close races uh, because, once again, the election counting for Connecticut has been slower tonight. Um, one district we can count on for a slight result is the 26th, con 26th Congressional District. Sorry about that. CC Mayor is at about 57% of the vote, and Tony Boucher is at about 43. Now, this is not a guaranteed lead. This does not mean anything for uh, Mayor, but this does indicate that the, she might have uh, this race in the bag later tonight. Uh, much like the 24th district, we're still waiting on results from the 28th district. Um, and the same thing goes for the rest of the congressional districts in Connecticut. Next, we're going to look at the attorney general race. Now, this race is a bit closer. Uh, we've got 96,000 votes for uh, Tong and 76 for Cordes. This race uh, is close, but William Tong, the incumbent, is most likely be going to be able to hold on to his seat. Um, this race for the Secretary of State of Connecticut is uh, not quite as close. We are still looking at two new candidates, so this race, uh, we're unsure from incumbency who might win, but Stephanie Thomas is leading Dominic Rapini uh, by about uh, 20,000 votes, which is a pretty good lead. Um, and then once again, the probate judge of Danbury, we're still waiting on results from this race, but Joseph De Silva versus Dom Chifalo, uh, this race should be interesting and very important to the local Connecticut. Uh, later tonight, if you come back, we will be covering races around the state, and we should include more races now that it is past 10 and races have closed around the country. Uh, we're still waiting on a couple states, but the majority of states have now closed their polling, so we will be able to update you with more numbers later. Back to you guys in the studio. Great. Well, thank you so much for the update there, Jake. Really appreciate it, man. Now, I have to say, it's very curious to see how things are going to pan out tonight. We're seeing some jumps happening numbers-wise in terms of uh, uh, how votes are being tallied as they get counted. We had a lot of mail-in ballots being counted at the beginning of the evening. Now we're starting to see a lot of more rural votes being counted. So it's causing a shift in some states. And as of right now, it's still pretty much impossible to predict anything. But uh, it's very cool nonetheless to see that sort of change and, and shift happen. Um, we are seeing for a couple different states having larger percentages of their votes being reported now. Uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Senate race, which I know everyone is up in arms mm -hmm. about, uh, between Fetterman and Oz, was previously at around 9% reporting. Now, Associated Press has said that there's 37% of votes are being reported. So we're getting up there. We're closing know, that yeah. gap a little bit. And who knows? We might even have an answer tonight. Though that would be difficult to say um, either way. But it is possible. 
Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing looking forward to seeing what uh, what happens the rest of the evening. However, we have our field reporter Ryan ready for us in the field. So let's hear from him about how everything is going. Ryan, what do you got for us? Thanks, Jacob. So. As the numbers have been trickling in, the vibe keeps getting better here. People are happy, the music's playing. Everyone seems to be happy with the numbers that have been coming in specific to these Connecticut races. Uh, another thing that has been trickling around has been that Fox News apparently has called the race for Lamont. However, Associated Press has not. The numbers are looking really good though. So that is another thing on top of this Blumenthal race that continues to make people happy here at the Democratic headquarters. I think eyes are now starting to shift more nationally and seeing how the Democrats, the Democrats more nationally are doing as well. And we're looking at races like Fetterman won, the Warnock won. Everyone seems to be glued to the television and seeing how the outcomes are going to be. Absolutely. Well, it's curious that you mentioned those national elections sort of coming into the focus a little bit more, Ryan. That's uh, not terribly surprising, as honestly, a lot of people feel that they might have uh, those elections might have a, a bigger impact on our day-to-day -day life um, here in Connecticut and for everyone watching around the country. So very cool stuff there. Uh, interesting that, that Fox News called it early before the Associated Press actually did. Reminds me of when Fox News called Arizona uh, in the 2020 uh, presidential election. They called Arizona for Biden early, um, and Trump was not a huge fan of that. Um, so we'll have to see exactly uh, how everything pans out. But as of right now, polling wise and from what you're saying, especially, it does seem to look like the Dems are taking the lead, especially uh, in, in Blumenthal's race for governor here in Connecticut. So thanks so much, Ryan. Very, very cool. Thanks, Jacob. Of course. So as I mentioned briefly there, we have a lot going on nationwide, a lot of governor elections, a lot of uh, races for the Senate that people are really paying attention to. Um, these kind of elections have a, a monumental impact on how our country is going to be run for the next several years. And it's something that uh, we really need to, to take into account. It's why everyone should go vote, right? Because, you know, this stuff matters. If you're worried about inflation, you should go vote. Absolutely. If you're worried about social issues, you should go vote. Absolutely. You know? And Jacob, it says now, uh on a NBC poll uh, as late as yesterday, uh, it says that 21% of America thinks that uh, the country is going in the right direction, whereas 72% is going in the wrong direction. Hmm. So these are all things we have to kind of put together and make our decision from. So. Well, 72% of the country saying that we're not moving in the right direction yeah. is a little bit concerning, I'd say. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of that is due to economic hardship um, that Americans have experienced recently, which is something we'll dive into a little bit later on. But a large part of that is also due to some social changes that we are seeing. For example, the repealing of Roe v. Wade. So let's take a quick look at a story about abortion. Abortion is supposed to be one of the safest and most common medical procedures, but the overturning of Roe v. Wade has restricted access to safe abortion services provided in Planned Parenthoods like this one, immediately putting millions of women at risk. When people with unwanted pregnancies are limited to safe and timely abortions, they often resort to dangerous methods. According to a report by the World Health Organization, the maternal mortality rate in the United States grew by 136% between 1990 and 2013. Even before Roe was overturned, many were still unable to receive abortion care and pregnancy-related deaths were and still are occurring at an alarming rate. When we reached out to Connecticut Senator up for re-election, Richard Blumenthal, he referred us to a statement which said, Every American should have the right to decide whether and when to have children. Politicians do not know better than women what kind of care they need from their physicians. On the contrary, Blumenthal's Republican competitor, Leora Levy, stated the following on Twitter, As a mother, I'm proud to be recognized by SBA Pro-Life for my work advocating for the unborn. Extremists like Blumenthal favor allowing abortion up until the moment of birth. In the Senate, I will always be a strong voice and protect life. Having two very distinct and differing opinions on each side should make it easier for Connecticut residents to decide who to vote into the Senate based on their individual beliefs. 
Although Connecticut remains a sanctuary state, most of the United States has been affected by the overturning, and Connecticut could be next, depending on who is put into office following the election. We have seen that these restrictions do not result in fewer abortions. Instead, they oblige women to seek back alley abortions that risk their lives and health. This is Nazmia Dionis with WCSU News Election Connection. So as we can see there, abortion definitely coming to the forefront of the American political theater, if you will, mm -hmm. once again, where it hasn't really been for a few decades after Roe v. Wade was originally passed. It's something that a lot of Americans are up in arms about. They feel as if their privacy is being invaded, mm -hmm. given the Supreme Court's uh, recent overturning of Roe v. Wade, which did not criminalize your uh, abortion or anything like that, but it did make it a state-by-state -state basis. Yes. But I think it's important to understand a lot of people um, get confused about what the, the repealing of Roe v. Wade means. All that means is that states are free to make their own decisions about abortion laws and that uh, abortion is not codified as a federal uh, uh, mm -hmm. right in our Constitution, yes. which is something that I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, uh, uh, understandably they're upset about it. But it's important uh, to realize what is exactly happening rather than blowing it out of proportion. Something know? that I found very interesting, Jacob, is um, uh, three months ago, uh, September, it was at 23% um, of what voters care about right now. And right now, as of yesterday, it's at 9% that voters care about abortion the most, mm -hmm. which is like, very, to me, very, very alarming where, as in two months, we could change so fast of what... Um, um, hits us the most and what we want to vote for the most. Well, this is what happens with any hot button political issue, right? We see this happen with Black Lives Matter. We saw this happen with uh, Ukraine and Russia, right? When something is in the news cycle, everyone cares about it, mm -hmm. right? Everyone, it's, it's there. Suddenly they're passionate about it for about a week or two and then everyone stops caring about it yeah. because something else comes up. Um, and so, my apologies, that was from a CNN poll. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, no, I think that's totally fine. So I, I think, yeah, that, that sort of uh, shift in uh, public opinion is not totally unprecedented. And we see this a lot of the time with social issues where they'll come and go. But at the end of the day, the economic issues really stay around, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, people largely are, are more concerned with how much their gas is costing and how much their food is costing versus things like Ukraine or abortion. Right. Those are usually secondary when it comes to economic issues, which is crazy. It sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy, sounds crazy but it's not. Crazy. But the, the cost of living is is the largest yes. predictor of uh, the way that Americans are going to vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because it's constant. Right. It's yeah. a constant thing that you will notice regardless of who you are or what you are. You know, abortion is something that women vote on, mm -hmm. you know, either uh, for or against it very strongly. Right. Whereas everyone, men and women are severely affected by any sort of economic uh, sure. uh, inflation or, or hardship, um, <clears throat> similar to what we're seeing now mm -hmm. in America. But so, yeah, definitely something uh, that, that we'll have to keep in mind. And uh, another market that's been severely affected by this economic sort of turmoil that the U.S. is in right now is the housing market, right? We're seeing uh, different mortgage rates reach percentages that they haven't for a long time. A lot of people are, are fearing that this might be a repeat of 2008, right? There might be a, a bubble that has to be popped essentially in the housing market. And uh, Governor Ned Lamont has tried to take some steps to improve this housing market and make it a little bit more bulletproof so that young people, lower income people can afford places to live. So let's take a look at this story right now. Governor, housing is the biggest expense for many families these days, and some find themselves unable to find proper housing at all. Does the state have resources available, and how do you plan on tackling this issue? Oh, yeah. No, we have put hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for affordable housing, a big boost. And not, you know, it's housing for everybody. It's housing for um, single folks who don't necessarily want, um, you know, four room, four bedrooms and an acre of land. You know, Connecticut's got a lot of that. We need downtown. We need housing in downtown Danbury. We need places for single people to live. I need places for retired folks so they can uh, don't have to um, manage a single family house, but they can get uh, some nice housing downtown. And that would free up a nice place for uh, Nico when you become a uh, journalist. <laughs> 
And um, I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of people are hesitant. And, uh, look, I believe in local control. I think Danbury is going to be able to take the lead. I think most of our uh, municipalities are taking the lead. I'm going to give them the financial incentives to do the right thing. And I'll tell you one last thing. Every single business I talk to, uh, they ask me, will there be housing for our young employees? Because uh, Connecticut doesn't have a reputation for vibrant cities and single family um, or you know, single bedroom units, downtown studios. That's really a big priority for me. Thank you so much. And then housing is the biggest expense for many families these days, and some find themselves unable to find proper housing at all. What do you plan to do to tackle this issue? Well, it's a big issue, and I'm actually a product of affordable housing. I, I grew up in New Haven, and um, my dad wanted to, to go to better schools in North Haven, so we bought a $25,000 house um, with my three sisters and me, and uh, it was a terrific experience. But, um, you know, people shouldn't have to move um, out of the cities for affordable housing. Um, people should um, be able to be mobile um, when they want to. I just think the current law, 830G, hasn't worked. It was put in place before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, most towns do not comply. I think we need to work together um, between the state and the towns to come up with a plan. It's not one size fits all. Um, you know, we need to protect people's largest asset by not putting skyscrapers next to them. On the other hand, we need to provide affordable housing for people who, who, who want to take advantage of that. And um, so I'm supportive of it. And I think that uh, it's critical in Connecticut, but we need to find a different approach. We're calling for a repeal of 830G. Uh, we should sit down and, and start over and use a collaborative approach to figure this out. Thank you so much, Mr. Stefanowski. So very interesting positions there from Bob Stefanowski and current Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont about how to deal with the housing issue. Now, according to Connecticut Insider, between 2020 and 2022, the price of the average home in Connecticut has increased by $83,000, which is a crazy increase in two years. And it's something that you know, we have to stop. <laughs> if that continues, who knows where we'll be two or three years uh, from now. And we have to do something to try and bring down uh, costs of, of housing and general cost of living. So I am really glad to see that these two men are somewhat aware of that, at least trying to do something to, uh, to sort of fight against that uh, large increase that we're seeing in the housing market. But let's head now to our next field reporter of the night. Tyler is coming in with some new information for us on the Johanna Hayes versus George Logan race. Tyler, how's everything looking out there? Yeah, so very similar uh, to before, Jacob. We're still just outside the Republican headquarters, and the numbers are still coming in. Obviously, it's still at around 15 to 20% reporting, but this is going to be a razor-thin race, Jacob, as it is about 53% to Johanna Hayes to 47% to George Logan at this moment. Wow, I see. So seems like things are, are definitely a close gap there. Now, do you think that as more votes come in over time and we start to see, you know, more votes be counted from rural areas, we start to see, you know, uh, that, that all the mail-in ballots, all the early voting ballots are kind of counted um, ahead of time now. And now we're really counting uh, those votes from today specifically. Do you think that might cause any sort of shift? in who's voting for who exactly, or do you think these percentages are kind of going to stay steady where they are? Well, uh, between the times that I've been on camera, I, the one trend that I did see thus far was George Logan making around a 500 vote jump towards Johanna Hayes. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, during the course of these votes being counted, if that trend continues, if it starts pulling away towards Johanna Hayes's side, but that's the first uh, trend that I've seen thus far in the early going. 
Interesting. Well, Associated Press says that only 17% reporting right now, which is a very low margin. So obviously all this is very much subject to change, but I really do appreciate you giving us this insight here, Tyler. It's great to hear from you, and we'll come back to you later in the evening. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jacob. Of course. So still two races very close between Hayes and Logan here in Connecticut with 17% reporting from the Associated Press. That's less than a fifth of our total votes in. Perhaps we'll see Logan come up and, and take the lead. Um, though Hayes, I have it in front of me right here now, though Hayes still is sitting at around 53% of the votes that have been counted. So she is leading by about 5%, which is a hard lead for Logan to overcome. But we'll see. You never know. Again, with 17% of the vote being in as of yet, it is very hard to predict um, what to kind of expect moving forward, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're seeing some, some uh, differing opinions between these two candidates as well. Um, some similar opinions. Yeah, some similar opinions as well, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's something that uh, I think will resonate with a lot of voters and kind of the same issue that we saw and that, and that you asked me about with Herschel Walker in Georgia, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that having a black candidate running for the Republican Party actually might help draw some African-American voters away from the Democrats. And it's not a steadfast rule, mm -hmm. in my view, mm -hmm. but simply just because you know, they, they might relate to him more, mm -hmm. right? And people like to vote who they relate to. Do you think that uh, Johanna Hayes being the incumbent for so long, do you think when voters now are saying uh, it's time for a new face? Well, I think that could be the other thing. Okay. You know, I think a lot of, I think the other large thing that's kind of swing against Johanna Hayes here, some would argue that her experience is a advantage. And I think it seems that way at face value. But honestly, if people feel like she's been doing a bad job, mm -hmm. they're going to want a different face in the office, regardless of, of uh, uh, political party. Mm -hmm. This is what a lot of people need to understand, that at a, at a local level, at a state level, it's a lot less about political party, mm -hmm. right? And it's it's a lot more about what has this person done or what are they saying that they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, what can they do for me? Exactly, exactly. Um, so very interesting uh, uh, race there, and one that we're going to keep coming back to, because uh, it obviously relates quite a bit to, uh, to Connecticut and where we are right now, Danbury, Connecticut, where Westcom is located. But for the moment, we're going to head into our next story of the night, banning books. Is this a problem in American schools? Let's take a look. In your time of working with books and being in libraries, has there ever been um, a time in America where there has been this much controversy about books? Recently, there has been a very um, there's been a significant uptick in book challenges. I want to be clear, though, be, before we go too much further, though, there is a difference between book challenges and book banning. So as we start to have our conversation, um, more books are being challenged. It's not, they're not necessarily being removed from libraries or banned, but it definitely has gone up a worrying amount. Books such as Harry Potter, To Kill a Mockingbird, um, even the Bible, how do you feel that that takes away from um, children's learning education today? Is, there's a lot packed into that question. Um, there's there's your formal education process that you go through, and then there is your outside of formal education. I think removing material that speaks to people, that, that people uh, rely on or people enjoy reading, um, only hurts society as a whole. So... Because a book is in a library or in a public space does not compel you to read it. But if that book or material is not available, it really uh, disenfranchises the people who do want to read it. And these books that you mentioned become classics or become very popular for a reason. People like them. People want to consume them. Um, and when you take away that possibility for people, when you take away their access to that uh, information or to that material, you're disenfranchising them and basically saying they're not as important as other people. I am a big believer, possibly you could have guessed that on my choice of profession as a librarian, that um, books and literature and information spark conversation. And there are a lot of, um, so for example, uh, with young children, and my own young children, I would accompany them to the library to choose books. 
we would read those books together and we would talk about the content of those books, whether it was controversial or whether it was difficult or whether they were intrigued by it. Um, it gave us an opportunity to connect over what they enjoyed, what they what bothered them, what they were scared of, and that sort of thing. Not everybody has that opportunity, um, but uh, I think it's an important piece. And that's tri- that happens in, in, library, uh, edu- in educational settings as well. So in any elementary classroom, you would see a large array of books students, children could choose from. Um, and then that teacher who knows the content of all of those books is able to have conversations with those students and fill in blanks for them, answer questions for them. And I think that's really important to use literature um, for that purpose. As students get older in the adolescence, and we've all been through adolescence and we know how difficult it can be, sometimes books can be really good friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whether or not it's sparking a conversation with a parent or an educator, it's sparking or inspiring to uh, an adolescent him or herself. So maybe they are diff- dealing with something difficult in their own lives and they don't feel that they can talk to an educator or a parent or a guardian, um, but we might be able to find some comfort in a book. I feel like all libraries are book sanctuaries um, or, or information sanctuaries um, and taking explicit steps to ensure that challenged books are preserved and made available um, is, an, is important work to do. Um, there is something called the Library Bill of Rights. It comes from an organization called the American Library Association and it basically says this material, all material is made for the people who want to consume it, and there should be no um, barriers to accessing and, and consuming that information if you want to. Um, and there's, it's, it's a long statement, um, but, but that's sort of the gist of it. And um, e- even if that material is challenging or some people's uh, um, opinion of challenging, it should be made available to the people who need it or want it. So something that you find challenging, I might find inspiring or comforting or um, or furthering my understanding of something. It's kind of like, um, what's a controversial food? I know that this <laughs> peanuts. Cool. If you're allergic to peanuts, it doesn't mean I shouldn't be able to have peanuts, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So you don't have to eat peanuts if you don't want to. So keeping those materials safe so that they don't end up unavailable um, is super important. What I think is different about this moment in book challenges, book challenges have always happened. Um, But I think the media attention on book challenges has made it um, attractive to people who would not necessarily have taken that step before. So exactly. So you have um, very small local challenges in in libraries and schools, Mm -hmm. and it gets picked up by the national media, which inspires other people who may be of the same persuasion or may, may... also feel the same way to do it in their local areas too. So I think that um, it really depends on the way society kind of moves um, and whether or not this is going to get what I would characterize as worse or um, whether or not some of this is going to subside um, as we learn more about our society and our neighbors. And and, uh, I I will just say also that um, in higher education, we don't have these kinds of issues in our libraries because we deal only with adults, almost 100%, right? We do have a small juvenile collection in our library for the pre-service teachers, but um, we don't deal with these kinds of things. Um, so I'm not as well versed in some of this stuff, but um, there have definitely been concerns about academic libraries um, and, and the materials they collect. Um, but we are very, very dedicated to preserving people's ability to access the information they want or they need um, without judgment and um, without barriers. So banning books, definitely something that I think some Americans are concerned about, perhaps rightfully so, as some would argue that this was, you know, maybe a, a, even a form of censorship. But on the other side, you have a lot of parents who are concerned about what their kids are learning in the classroom. Yeah, Jacob, this is true. Uh, books like Harry Potter, the Bible, um, even Dr. Seuss are being uh, known as uh, um, restricted on kids and how they're supposed to look at books. Uh, Jake, I have a question for you. Um, did you grow up uh, reading To Kill a Mockingbird? I did, yeah. So every, it seems like every uh, child 
every uh, child that's went through high school has read the book or well, has yeah. seen the book in some type of way, as, lo uh, as well as the Diaries of Anne Frank, if... Um, if sure, yes. yeah. Okay. And for some reason, these books are now being either reported or banned, and I just don't see a reason why. Do you, do you think these books should well, be banned? Well, it's, it's because... Let's use To Kill a Mockingbird as an example, yeah, right? It's a book that is set far earlier in American history. And because of that, there's certain racial epithets in that book that a lot of people find offensive. And So don't you feel like we should learn about it? Well, it's okay to find them offensive, but I don't think it's okay to honestly get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's part of, an unfortunate part of American's history. And if anything, learning about it is important. And granted, you know, it has to be, you know, kids the right age. I don't think middle schoolers should be reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Well, that's when I, that's when I picked up the book, actually, so. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Well, perhaps maybe eighth grade, yeah. right? But it just, you know, uh, with some of that more mature content, you mm -hmm. should say. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess maybe that could, we could wait a little bit for that. Um, but getting rid of it entirely? No, I don't think that's the right book. Okay, understand. Um, yeah, but anyway, so we do actually have our field reporter, Jimmy, back on the line. He's going to be giving us some updates again on that Julie Kushner versus Michelle Coelho race. Let's hear what he's got for us. Jimmy, how's everything looking out there? How you doing, Jacob? Yeah, so I'm here in Danbury uh, still at Anthony's Lake Club. This is now where the Republicans are going to be celebrating for the rest of the night, um, they moved from their Republican headquarters where we were earlier in the night. Um, and we did just get here, but I did get the chance to speak to um, Michelle's campaign manager just for a quick second. And he was on the phone, um, I'm assuming, with a numbers guy or someone from one of the polls. And they were still unable to get those numbers that we've been waiting for. Um, the, there was just a loud cheer with it within the inside. So maybe some numbers just came in that I don't know about. But... Yeah, so then I actually had the chance to go downstairs. I got a chance to see a few other people um, who were reporting on the numbers, and they told us we had to leave immediately. So I'm now reporting from outside. Um, but at the moment, it seems that no numbers have came in for this race. Um, but as I just said, there was a loud cheer. So maybe that's good things for Coelho, but who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell at this point. Interesting that they're sort of safeguarding vote counts at this moment, I can imagine it's an intense situation for the Republicans right now uh, because they are certainly the underdogs in this race and in a lot of these races across Connecticut. So cool to see that, um, you know, there, there might be some, uh, some good feelings from, from the Republican camp. I wonder if they know something we don't. Um, but uh, again, until we officially know something, it is just frustratingly difficult to actually uh, make any sort of statement, you know? Yeah, and, and as I mentioned with that with that vote counter error and technicality going on at one of those wards, that doesn't just affect Democrats, it affects Republicans too in getting those votes in. So like like you said, like I said, we're we're all patiently waiting for these votes, waiting to see who's gonna come out on top of the twenty fourth Senate district here. And it's it's gonna be a tight one, as I mentioned, all night. Well, I can certainly see that. And uh, that's definitely what the polls were saying going into this race. So no surprise there. But thanks so much, Jimmy. I really appreciate the, uh, the quick, succinct updates here. This is great. I'm glad that you're out there at, uh, at Anthony's Lake Club to get sort of a live reaction and understand what's going on. So thanks so much for that. And uh, we'll come back to you later. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Hopefully I can come back with a little bit more for you. All right. All right. Let's hope so. Have a good one. All right. Well, as we were discussing briefly, uh, book banning and possible censorship is certainly a concern uh, among Americans. And it's definitely something that the Republican Party has uh, used to galvanize its own platform. Right. And we did see this at that candidate forum that we attended in Ridgefield. We've seen uh, Michelle Coelho especially take a stand against censorship and say, that, you know what, I'm, I'm really going to make sure that... Uh, you know, freedom of speech is protected. And, and we even saw it on the uh, Rob DeSantis ad a little bit earlier. Yes, 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 we did, for sure. And, you know, this is, this is something that I think a lot of people are, you know, it's, it's an American value, right? Mm -hmm. We always talk about freedom of speech. The First Amendment is an American value, an intrinsic American value, and it certainly is, right? It is the First Amendment that is enshrined in our Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. You know, when the founders wrote that, it's number one. Most important thing, freedom of speech. They put that as, as, as uh, number one. And I think a lot of people, you know, would probably argue that at the moment in America, I, I don't know if our speech is necessarily free. And this is something we can get into more later, but we've seen that a lot recently with things like social media, 
Twitter, you know, users being banned mm -hmm. on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. for statements that are not necessarily, uh, at least not in my opinion, inflammatory enough to warrant their account being revoked permanently, you know? Yes. Yeah. Seems, uh, seems startling to me. But uh, we'll talk about that censorship a little bit more later when we come back. For right now, let's head to student meteorologist Stephen. He's going to be giving us a quick update on the weather for the coming week. How's it looking, Stephen? Well, it's looking good for the work and school week. It's not looking so good for the weekend, unfortunately. It's fine right now, though, outside in Danbury. As of 10 o'clock, we had a temperature of 37 degrees, a dew point of 24. That's a 59% humidity and calm wind, and that temperature will continue to drop through the overnight hours tonight. We do have a few more warm days ahead. Not tomorrow, but Thursday and Friday will again be considerably above average before a major storm comes through through the area Friday night and Saturday, and then a chance of maybe our first snowflakes of this season on Sunday night, and we'll show you that in just a moment. First, though, I'll show you the satellite and radar, and I'll do this really quickly because Connecticut is right here, and guess what? There's no clouds and there's no rain. So all's well at the moment across the area. Now, that won't be the case on Friday night, and that would be because of this. This is Tropical Storm Nicole, and actually by the time that I have my next update, we'll have a new advisory and an updated track from the National Hurricane Center, but as we've been talking about all night, this tropical storm will hit Florida as a hurricane Thursday morning and then kind of ride right up the coast just to the west of the Danbury area. And that means that we're in for a pretty wild ride on Friday night with some damaging wind and heavy rain. What can we expect? Generally, one to four inches of rain right now. I'm leaning on the lower end of that just because that track has seemed to tick a bit to the west today. Uh, but wind gusts of 50 miles an hour certainly can't be ruled out, especially on the shoreline. If you live on the shoreline, that's definitely going to be the area that is the most exposed to the wind, as is usual. So uh, get your boats tied up and things like that. And then scattered tree and power line damage is certainly possible. It's fortunately not going to be as bad as this situation would have been had it been about a month ago with leaves on the trees. But Still, anytime you get wind above, you know, 40, 45 miles an hour, you start to get into trouble with some weaker limbs. So our forecast for tonight, 25 degrees, mainly clear, but a hard freeze is expected with those light winds and clear skies. Good night for radiational cooling all the way down into the mid-20s tonight. So definitely make sure that you do cover those plants. And then tomorrow, it's going to feel a lot colder than the mid-50s just because it's been so mild recently, but we're only getting up to 54 tomorrow. Seasonably cool temperatures. That's a lot closer to where we should be at this time of year before we guess what? get right back to where we were with mid-60s again Thursday and upper 60s even Friday, but unfortunately Friday afternoon tropical storm Nicole passes just to our west or the remnants thereof, and that will bring us heavy rain and gusty wind Friday night into Saturday morning. We should be dry Saturday afternoon, but stay mo mostly cloudy. Sunday morning looks all right, and then a different system completely unrelated to Nicole brings in another chance of showers for uh, Sunday evening, and that one could end as a bit of wet snow, especially in the higher elevations of Litchfield County. So definitely the chance for some of us to see our first flakes of the season uh, to begin the next work week. So overall, kind of a tale of two halves. Not bad for most of the work week, but then the weekend definitely not looking too great. Back to you guys, Jacob and Alec. Well, thank you so much for the update there, Stephen. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll keep coming back to you throughout the night just so all of our viewers are caught up on what they can expect for the next couple days and the weekend. But we do have a special guest joining us now over the phone, Dr. Mitch Wagner, who is a uh, environmentalist. He's a professor here at Western Connecticut State University. Dr. Wagner, how are you? Just fine. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us here tonight. Um, quite a few different things to uh, to talk about. And um, first and foremost, among them, I just I have to ask. Obviously, we've had a lot of uh, talk recently about uh, global warming, or climate change, more rather, really having an impact on quality of human life in the next couple decades. And the question that I'm sure is on everyone's minds is. Is it too late for us to turn back the clock? Well, it's never too late because we have uh, we have a whole lot of children and grandchildren and our future 
grandchildren's grandchildren to think about. We can't give up. <clears throat> There's just no way. We can't give up. And so we are going to have to make some hard decisions. If we're willing to make the hard decisions, we can do this. If we're not willing, then our grandchildren will think less of us. Hmm. And when you say hard decisions, could you give me an example of one of those? Hard decisions in terms of, of speeding up the uh, shift from fossil fuels to uh, renewable energy. Um, and that will, you know, of course, you know, in cause heartburn to anybody who owns uh, stock in fossil fuel companies and, and so on, but we've got to do it. There is no option. Sure. Now, a lot of people are concerned about some of the environmental impacts of, you know, different renewable uh, energy options and, and different more sustainable methods of transportation, right? Some are obviously ideas that I think most people would support, um, like, you know, more public transportation, excellent idea, right? But you have some critics who, you know, will pick on electric cars and say, well, they're not really feasible. The heavy metals that are needed to make batteries for these electric cars do a lot of damage to the environment when we mine for them and things like that. So do you have any rebuttal to critiques of uh, electric vehicle usage, things like, of that nature? Well, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing your question. Can you restate oh. your question uh, briefly? Sure. There's a lot of noise in the line. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, absolutely. No, no problems, Dr. Wagner. Pretty much what I'm asking is, there's a lot of people who are critical of electric vehicle usage because they feel that in order to make these electric vehicles, uh, there's, yeah. there's a lot of damage done to the environment while mining for certain metals mm -hmm. and things like that. So uh, I guess the question is, does, are, are there negatives? I don't know. Are, you're the expert. Are there negatives when it comes to creating these electric vehicles? And do those negatives, are they outweighed by the positives? Um, no. No. I mean, there's always negatives to any industrial uh, process. We're going to have to figure out how to do this humanely. We're going to have to figure out how to do this environmentally consciously and in a way that will, in fact, you know, allow us to manage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And final question for you here, uh, Dr. Wagner. Um, it seems to me that there's a lot of things that, other Amer that Americans care more about. Right? When we look at polling, climate change is something that is on the list, but it's a lot lower than things like inflation or crime or abortion uh, in terms of what people care about. Right? So what can we do to maybe make the American populace a little bit more aware of climate change as an issue and to sort of make sure that it, uh, it, it comes into the public focus as a problem that we really need to fix now? Well, one thing we can do is that each individual, as an individual, you can, you can find that topic which you particularly care about, that, that you're, the, you're an expert on, something you really are passionate about. Figure out how climate change affects that passion of yours. Learn all the details in such a way that you can explain to the general public and go out and do that. Excellent. Well, I think that's definitely a reasonable solution and a fantastic place to start. So uh, thank you for that, that insight. And thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Wagner. It's, it's really great to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Uh, bye. All right. Bye. Well, so uh, interesting commentary there from uh, one of our faculty members here at WCSU. Always good to hear from him and uh, some great insight there. Really happy to have him on. We're going to be heading now, though, to our field reporter, Ryan, who is taking a look at the Blumenthal v. Levy race. He'll be giving us some updates. Ryan, how is everything looking in the Democrat headquarters? Hi, Jacob. So as you might be able to see behind me, Attorney General William Tong has just declared victory, and he's giving his victory speech right now. He's touching on things such as going after the NRA, holding people responsible for the opioid crisis accountable and a lot of things like that. And again, the energy here seems to be great throughout the night. A lot of Democratic Democratic candidates who were predicted to win their elections are doing so. And yeah, just great vibes overall. 
Great. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that it seems to be an enjoyable environment to be in. Uh, that's great. Now, are there any other candidates that we can look forward to speaking tonight who haven't really said anything yet? So as far as who we have here tonight at Democratic headquarters, I believe the only person not to speak yet has been Ned Lamont. As we've seen, Fox has actually called the gubernatorial race for Lamont over Stefanowski. I'm not positive if Associated Press has done that yet, but Lamont does have a steady lead, so we can wait to see him later tonight. Right, and it does seem as if he's really maintained his lead as more of these votes have been counted throughout the evening. Um, so, again, can't make any predictions yet, um, but seems to be as if uh, a large trend is happening in the favor of, of Ned Lamont. But thank you for the update, Ryan. Uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, we'll come back to you as needed throughout the night, all right? Thank you, Jacob. Of course, absolutely. Well, so interesting to hear that Ned Lamont has really seemed to maintain his lead uh, so far. We actually do have some breaking news. Um, so we're going to go to the board here and get some numbers from Mr. Nicolari. Jake, what's going on? All right. Thank you, guys. So we have been struggling here at Election Connection to find any results for the 24th Congressional District between Julie Kushner and Michelle Coelho. And that may be in part because Coelho has just stepped down from the race. So that default makes Julie Kushner the representative for the 24th Congressional State District of Connecticut. Um, and that has decided that race. Thank you, guys. Wow. Well, uh, a surprise... Uh, r rescind uh, resignation, I guess you could say. The day um, of? of uh, uh, during the, uh, the electoral process. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that tells us pretty clearly yeah. that uh, for whatever reason, you know, Coelho had some, some, some vote numbers available to her, looked like things weren't going well, and wow. maybe she decided she would uh, simply step down. So <clears throat> It's really curious. Uh, when Jimmy was calling in, he heard that um, Coelho... Uh, 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 the headquarters that Quella was coming out of, I heard a cheer. So it, it I'm kind of confused right now to hear that she was just, uh, she just resigned in the race. It's a little surprising. It's a little surprising. Um, but perhaps, you know, maybe she figures it's all for the best. It's time to regroup and uh, move forward into the next one. And I think perhaps maybe wow. revamping uh, her campaign strategy might be beneficial for Coelho. Mm. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see moving forward, but maybe this is a learning experience, you know. Um, but obviously Kushner, as the incumbent, she's done a lot for the local community, a lot for Connecticut. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to beat that, you know. Um, but uh, so to be honest with you, no surprises there. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so what we're going to head into now is a quick story here, an interview from John Stewart. So let's take a look. Why would the state of Arkansas step in to override parents, physicians, psychiatrists, endocrinologists who have developed guidelines? Why would you override those guidelines? Well, I think it's important that all of those physicians, all of those experts, for every single one of them, there's an expert that says we don't need to allow children to be able to take those medications. That there are many instances right. where- But you know that's not true. You, you know it's not for everyone, there's one. There's, these are the established- Well, I don't know that, that that's not true. I don't know that- Then why, you would, know you, that. why would you pass a law then if you, don't, if you don't know that that's true, wouldn't you- Well, I know so? that there are doctors and that we had plenty of people come and testify before our legislature mm -hmm. who said that, uh, you know, we have 98% of the young people who have gender dysphoria, right. uh, that they are able to move past that. And once they have the, the help that they need, no longer suffer from gender dysphoria, 98% wow. without uh, that medical treatment. That's, that, an, that's an, so, an incredibly made up figure. That's That doesn't comport with any of the studies or documentation that exists from these medical organizations. What what medical association are you talking about of these doctors? Well, we have all of that in our uh, legislative history and we'll be glad to provide that to you. Uh, I don't have the name of that off the top of my head. I know it's something that- You don't have the name of the organization that, that you're getting Off the top of my head. Oh, okay. But yes, we have all of that cited in all of our briefs. You're suggesting that 
Protecting children means overriding the recommendations of the American Medical Association, the American Association of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough to show that these drugs are effective and that these children are better off and that we should you don't encourage have enough these. Or it's not enough for you. Let, let, me, let me try and flip it a different way and see if maybe this, this can help. In Arkansas, if you have pediatric cancer, and obviously we all want to protect children, I think we established that earlier. Whose guidelines do you follow for pediatric cancer? Well, I think if my child, who is four, if I was faced with that terrible uh, decision, then I would be speaking to my doctor. And if my doctor recommended something that I disagreed with, then I would get a second opinion. And that's what mm -hmm. I believe that these parents need to make sure that they're encouraged to get numerous opinions when they're talking about an irreversible step. You're not letting them. Here. The state's not saying get another opinion. What they're saying is you can't. What you're actually saying no, is the opposite. No, that's actually not at all what the state said. The state simply said that you cannot perform these procedures and so parents should get another opinion that they and children should want to have another opinion. But that's not. Because again, these are 9, 10, 11, So if your child is suffering from pediatric cancer and the state comes in and says to you, they recommend chemotherapy but we're not going to let you do that. You can't. We think you should get a different opinion. And here's the organization we think you should get the opinion from. They're not the mainstream, but they're an organization. So that's how you, that's who you have to be treated by. Does that sound like something you would Well, accept? I think that's a very extreme example that's not at all in line with what we're talking about. We're not saying that at some point, because when you have cancer, it literally is, and particularly pediatric cancer, and having friends that have lost children sure. to pediatric cancer, having a four-year-old, I'm sure. I've got some bad news for you. Parents with children who have gender dysphoria have lost children to suicide and, and depression. And they absolutely Because it's have. acute. And so these mainstream medical organizations have developed guidelines through peer-reviewed data and studies. And through those guidelines, they've improved mental health outcomes. So I'm confused why you follow AMA guidelines and AAAP guidelines for all other health issues than Arkansas, because we checked, but not for this. It's simply saying, let those young people who are facing gender confusion and dysphoria, allow them to become adults and to make that decision. Allow a child to be a child. So here's where we have our, our crossroads. You've made the determination that protecting these children means not giving them access to the guidelines and care that have been designed by medical and mental health professionals for children expressing gender dysphoria. And I'm asking you again, what are your qualifications to step in and say, no, keeping you from that care is protecting you. You've made that determination. Well, these are irreversible decisions that these children at these young ages are making or that their They're parents are making. They're not making the decision. You're making it sound like a nine-year-old walks into a doctor's office and says, give me some testosterone. And the doctor goes, oh, thank God because we're wanting to create an army of transgenders because we're crazy. And they go right in like- No, we passed a law to protect the children in Arkansas. And I think that's what is important. Again, the medical community disagrees with you. That well, that's not all of the children. medical community. Who doesn't? Who we do? have had experts testify here in Arkansas. Okay, from what medical organizations? Well, we have all of those in our briefs, and I apologize that I wasn't prepared to have a Supreme Court argument today in front of you, but uh, we are going to have arguments on this case uh, when the time comes. Well, so very interesting interview there from uh, John Fetterman, definitely making his point clear about uh, he, him wanting young children to have access to uh, different methods of, of uh, transgender health care. But we're going to be heading now uh, to our field reporter. Um, he'll be giving us some updates in the field. So, Tyler, how's everything looking out there? 
Yeah, Jacob. So we're back here at Johanna Hayes Democratic Campaign Headquarters. And I don't know if you could see, but there's no longer anybody inside of there. They've all relocated to a nearby Marriott Hotel where they will be either celebrating or grieving. Uh, so the latest statistics that I've seen in the numbers so far is around 25 percent recorded votes. And Johanna Hayes has received uh, roughly 53% of those votes, and George Logan is around 47%. Uh, so, as I said, only a quarter of the votes have been counted. This race is way too early to call, and it is razor tight as we expected. Absolutely. Well, I have to say, things are getting close here. Uh, and we're seeing that in Connecticut, we're seeing it uh, across the nation, in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, the margin between Oz and Fetterman just keeps getting closer. So really interesting stuff here. And uh, thank you so much for the update there, Tyler. So we'll come back to you throughout the evening. But uh, thank you. And uh, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Jacob. Absolutely. Well, a lot of different races to cover tonight. A lot of different things that we're going to be coming back to periodically just to make sure that you're all updated well on everything that's happening in Connecticut and around the nation. Uh, and, and as I just said to Tyler, I mean, holy cow, things are, things are, things are tight. It's yeah. hard to tell where any of these races are going to be swing or, uh, or what might happen. You know, we're seeing um, in Ohio, the race is a little bit closer than expected. We're seeing in Georgia, the race is incredibly close, right, um, for, uh, for governor. So crazy, crazy stuff yeah. there. And uh, I mean, it's, it's great to see it so close because it means that people are coming out and, and, and voting in mass. Yes, yes. But it's just something that, you know, um, if you're in our position. <laughs> yeah, we kind of want to see the results. We want to see some numbers. We want to see some results. So it makes our job uh, a, a little bit more difficult. But that's all right. That's what we're here for. So um, thanks so much for watching. We'll be right back. About half the people using public restrooms don't wash their hands. But it's the most effective way to prevent infection. It's simple. Just wash your hands. Get the facts. It's good for you, Connecticut. It's good for all of us. Speech isn't always spoken. Sometimes it's dance. Sometimes it's painted. Sometimes it's written. Sometimes it's all about the style. So I say what I love to say. What I need to say. What I have the right to say. Speech isn't always spoken. Know your right to express yourself. Your sneeze produces 5,000 bacteria-filled droplets, and they can travel 10 feet. So sneeze into your sleeve, and you'll reduce the spread of infection. Get the facts. It's good for you, Connecticut. It's good for all of us. Welcome to Election Connection, Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage. I'm Jacob Schultz. This is Election Connection's 12th year, and we are here tonight until midnight with news and issues important to Connecticut. And I'm Alec Riasic. Tonight we're covering national and state races, including those races in Fairfield County. Let's go to the board with Jake Nicolari for an update on those numbers. Jake, make us smarter. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Jacob. Tonight at about 11 o'clock, we will be covering races both in state and out of state. This is going to be very important uh, to the Senate, the House of Representatives. The ballot measures in Connecticut are still looking like a yes. We're at about a 60% yes, 40% no to allow for the CT uh, legislature to start writing an amendment for early voting. Um, first, we're looking at the CT race between Governor Ned Lamont and uh, our, his opponent, Bob Stefanowski. Currently, Ned Lamont is about 30,000 votes ahead, keeping his lead, but it is not, once again, not anything that guarantees that Ned Lamont will win. Um, as we announced before, Richard Blumenthal by AP Associated Press has been decided the winner over Leor Levy. 
In the 5th Congressional District, we are still looking at a very close race, only about 4,000 votes. Johanna Hayes is at 41,000. George Logan is at 37,000. This race is super important to CT because we have George Logan, while a uh, for distancing himself from Trump, has still uh, held quite the Republican line. Um, he is pro-abortion, but um, just like Johanna Hayes, but he is uh, not. We're not sure if he will caucus with the rest of the Republican Party. Um, in the 24th district, as announced earlier in our breaking news segment, Julie Kushner has been decided the winner over Michelle Coelho. Uh, in the 26th Congressional District, we are still looking at a pretty close race with uh, C.C. Moore at 5,133 votes versus Tony Boucher at 3,373. Next, we'll be looking at the 28th Congressional District where uh, Tony Huang, the incumbent, is still holding his lead. But as you can see, it's a very narrow lead. It does not guarantee anything for him. But with his incumbent seat and with it being so late in the night already, I'm fairly sure we might be able to say that he will keep his seat. Next, uh, we're still missing some numbers for some of those uh, local races. They've yet to come through, uh, whether it's the counting machines uh, having malfunction issues or we're just uh, l slow on the reporting. Uh, we will sure get back to these numbers later tonight to keep you updated. Uh, for Attorney General, we are currently looking at William Tong, the incumbent, uh, building quite the lead over Cordis, but it's not anything to guarantee the win. Pretty sure that he might be able to keep his seat, much like Huang. Uh, the CT Secretary of State, we have Stephanie Thomas and Do uh, Dominic Rapini. Stephanie Thomas has been able to build a little bit of a lead over Dominic Rapini, but that does not mean that she is guaranteed the win at all. And lastly, in Connecticut, we're looking at the probate judge of Danbury. This race, uh, we've yet to hear any reporting about, but we will make sure to keep you updated if we do. Now, moving on, we are going to look at races out of the state. So this could change the Senate majority. These are very important races. We're getting more numbers as the night goes on. Um, First, we're going to look at Arizona, where we've started getting numbers, and Mark Kelly, the incumbent who was voted in in a special election in 2020, has been able to keep his lead and you know keep his favor with the uh, Arizonian people. But Blake Masters is giving Kelly quite the run for his money, uh, getting 522,000 votes so far. Next, we're going to be looking at the Georgia Senate race. Now, this race, once again, the counting has been impeccable. This is a very close race, but Herschel Walker, as you can see, has been able to build a lead over Warnock. Uh, he's built about a 30,000 vote lead, which is pretty good this late in the night, but it does not guarantee anything. And with a vote like this, with a race this close, we could be seeing a runoff election in Georgia this winter. Next, we look at the Nevada Senate, and polling places in Nevada were supposed to close at 11, we, uh, at 10, and we were supposed to start getting results, but we still have not heard anything from Nevada. Next, we look at New Hampshire, where Maggie Hassan has been able to keep her lead from earlier tonight. She is about 30,000 votes over Don Bullock, uh, but this does not guarantee her the win, since only about 35% of the vote has been counted. In Ohio, we are seeing J.D. Vance continue to build his lead from earlier. It was only a slight lead earlier, but now he's about uh, 200,000 votes ahead of Tim Ryan. Impressive lead, um, and this is indicated in the polls from before the election, where J.D. Vance had been on a sharp incline in uh, p p uh, political favor, which could mean that people were... Um, turning out in numbers to support J.D. Vance right before the election, and could be why polling wasn't so accurate for this race. In Pennsylvania, we're looking at a race that keeps getting closer as the night goes on, most likely because mail-in ballots and early ballots uh, favor John Fetterman, the Democrat, while in-person voting favors Mehmet Oz. Uh, but this race is still, they're still keeping quite the distance between each other. John Fetterman has a bit of a lead, but once again, much like the other races, does not mean that we can guarantee Fetterman the win. 
in Utah. Numbers have just started coming through. We've got 1,000 votes for the independent Evan McMullen, and we've got almost 5,000 votes for our incumbent Mike Lee. This is most likely going to go to Lee, but these early numbers have no sway on that prediction. And in Wisconsin, we're looking at uh, Mandela Barnes and Ron Johnson, the incumbent. And Ron Johnson has been teetering his lead over uh, Barnes, but Barnes has been able to give Johnson quite the run for his money. Next, we'll be looking at Washington, and these results should be coming out just about now and later into the night because the polling places in Washington have just closed as of about six minutes ago. So we will make sure to keep you updated on these races and the other ones previously shown as the night continues. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks so much for the update there, Jake. Really appreciate it. A lot of these races still incredibly close really almost impossible to to call or make any prediction we've seen in the last few hours uh dr oz went from trailing fetterman yes by about five percent mm -hmm. to now I, I, if, if correct me if i'm if i'm wrong but i believe according to the associated press that he's now shrugged the margin to fetterman only having about a 1.5 yep. percent lead mm -hmm. so it's going to be a lot to see uh, and uh i mean who knows? It's scary how fast the numbers change. Yeah, they, it, it is. It is quite something. Uh, but so we're going to be heading now to our field reporter Ryan. He's in the field giving us some updates on the Blumenthal Levy race. So let's hear from him. Ryan, how's everything looking out there? Thank you, Jacob. So not much has changed since we last checked in. William Tong finished his victory speech. Of course, he won the attorney general race. And just to recap, we've had. Dick Blumenthal do his victory speech. We've now had Tong do his victory speech. And it seems like everyone here is now waiting for Ned Lamont to do his. He's been ahead by a steady margin. We've heard that places like Fox News have called the election for him quite early. So it seems like everyone here is still waiting. And as Jake had alluded by pointing to the national elections, everyone's eyes are starting to seem to focus on those. Going into tonight, of course, we're at the Democratic headquarters, so everyone seemed to be holding their breath in, seeing if we were going to see a red wave. But at least for now, it looks like it's been a bit of a red trickle. So everyone seems quite happy about that. But obviously, there's a lot of results to still come in. So we'll see. Absolutely. And it is very hard to predict. Uh, granted, I mean, as I just mentioned to Alec here, we saw the Pennsylvania race shift from Fetterman having a 5% lead to now just over a 1% lead. And that change happened in an hour, I want to say, right? Um, so I certainly don't think the same would happen here in Connecticut. It's a totally different scenario, right? But as we look at different races in Arizona, in Nevada, in Ohio, it's really important to understand that, you know, in Ohio, uh, we could see the Republican candidate lose his lead in, in 30 minutes, you know? It, it just depends how these votes are counted, what votes were counted first, that kind of thing, which is why until we start to get above 95% pardon me, of, uh, of votes being counted, it's nearly impossible to make a prediction. Um, but I, I'm uh, curious as to uh, why Ned Lamont, he seems to be holding out for his speech. Uh, he must have something special to say. So, um, yeah, looking, looking forward to, to hearing what, uh, what Lamont has to say, and uh, I think it's going to be uh, quite a fun time. Yeah, yeah, I feel like. But, um, all right, Ryan, well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it, and um, we'll, uh, we'll let you go. We'll come back in just a bit, all right? Thank you, Jacob. All right, of course. Well, so, uh, I mean, as, as I just said to Ryan, you know, these numbers are coming in. They're coming in fast. They're changing every minute here, really. Yeah. And uh, the Associated Press really does a fantastic job. And why do you, why, if, if Fox News is correct, which I don't think that they're not, why do you think that Ned Lamont's waiting so long to give his uh, victory speech? Well, I think he probably is, you know, he's been doing this for a while. Yeah. He's a professional. And what Lamont wants to set is the precedent that I'm not going to give my victory speech until... I've actually been declared the winner. Mm. You know what I mean? He doesn't want to come in preemptively, even if he does end up winning. Yes. You know, I don't think he, he wants to be classy. Um, and he probably in, in his head feels like it would be 
you know, almost uh, immature of him to give a preemptive victory speech, Understood. which I respect, actually. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's there's a certain candor to that that maybe we need more of in American politics. So um, it's nice of him. It's yeah. nice of him. Uh -huh. um, but also, who knows? Maybe he's just, maybe he's nervous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's nervous to give a speech. I don't know. Uh, but he's a career politician, so I, I doubt yeah, that. I doubt that, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, very interesting stuff. Very uh, cool things. And I'm, I'm really excited to see personally how the Pennsylvania race turns out. Yes, yeah. That's one that I know there's a lot of eyes on, especially yeah. after that last debate. Uh, really makes you wonder if Fetterman should have been up there um, or if perhaps his, his campaign manager sh should have said no to that one. Mm. Um, very unfortunate. But anyways, so um, what we're going to look for now is we're going to head to some weather updates from our student meteorologist, Stephen. Stephen's going to give us the look at what the next couple days are going to be like outside. How are they looking, Stephen? Well, the next couple of days look good. And you know what? I was uh, just looking at more information regarding the weekend system. And you know what? It's changed just like uh, a lot of the polls of, of the results have changed tonight over the last hour or so. So I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. Uh, right now, well, as of an hour ago, I'll update this for our next uh, weather session here. But right now we have a temperature of about 37 degrees in Danbury, dew point of 24. That's a 30.6 pressure, 59% humidity, calm wind as of 10 o'clock. It's a bit cooler now. Uh, a few more warm days are ahead. Now, I should say that's not tomorrow. It's Thursday and Friday. We are still looking at a major storm Friday into Saturday, but it's not quite as big as it looked about an hour or two ago, and I'll show you why in just a minute. And maybe we get to see our first flakes on Sunday night as well. We'll get to that later on. First, I do just want to briefly flash butt through the satellite and radar. Here's your satellite. Here's Connecticut. There's no clouds. Here's the radar. There's no rain. So there's nothing to speak about right now, but it's the weekend, unfortunately, that presents some problems for us. And that would be thanks to this tropical storm, Nicole, which is now actually very near hurricane status. It's only five miles an hour short, and it will be making its way into South Florida and then moving up the coast. But I want to point something out. Do you remember how an hour ago these little white circles here had the letter S in them for storm? They now are the letter D, which is depression, which is actually slightly weaker. And that's likely due to the fact that this system is moving further inland and away from the water, so it can't re-intensify quite as much. And that means that perhaps we get a bit of a break with a slight bit of lesser winds than we were originally expecting. So one to four inches of rain still seems reasonable. Again, I prefer those lower amounts right now. I think a lot of us are falling that one to two inch range, but there's enough wiggle room that the three or four inch totals could certainly still work their way into the state with a little bit more of a track wobble. Uh, the wind gusts I have reduced down to 40 or more, uh, just because, again, with the system moving further inland, it doesn't have that same kind of intensity that it can regain uh, had it been a bit closer to the water. Now, of course, this could also go back the other direction, but right now we're going with 40 mile an hour wind gusts, and that means that we're going to have isolated tree and power outage issues. Now, this is very uh, minor. At 40 miles an hour, you know, we can deal with. There will still be some very scattered issues here and there, uh, especially if you have dead trees or dead branches. Uh, but there's a really, uh, in terms of impact, there's a very big difference between 40 and 50 mile an hour winds in our area. So uh, that is very good news indeed. Now, I will go to the forecast for tonight, which is still the same. A very cold night, 25 degrees overnight, a hard freeze, and uh, definitely cover those plants if you haven't already. And then tomorrow, a high of 54 degrees, seasonable for this time of the year, and sunny, definitely nothing to worry about tomorrow. Then Thursday, also nothing to worry about. And in fact, Thursday looks like a great day to do any outdoor activities. You may have 64 degrees and sunny. Friday, 68 degrees, but we have increasing clouds through the afternoon, and then heavy rain and dusty wind moves in Friday night. It rains heavily Friday night into Saturday morning. It should stop by mid by early afternoon on Saturday. We'll be left with just cloudy skies and, a, again, a few more extra strong, a few more strong wind gusts coming out of the north as Nicole passes by. Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, 
dry. Then Sunday afternoon, a completely different system looks to bring us at least some showers and possibly a snowflake or two at the end, especially in the higher elevations of Connecticut. So uh, another couple of days of sunshine and then we start getting into trouble uh, right in time for the weekend, which is not ideal, but at the same time, it is a bit better than it was about an hour and a half ago. So overall, I think that's pretty good news. Let's go back to Alec and Jake. Thanks so much, Steve. Really appreciate it. Very cool stuff here. And uh, glad to hear that uh, perhaps that storm won't be as bad as we initially thought. We're going to be heading now to a quick update from one of our field reporters. He's going to be giving us some updates on the Kushner v. Coelho race here in Connecticut. Uh, so our field reporter, Jimmy, let's hear from Kushner. Yeah, Jacob. So last time I talked to you, we didn't have any results and we were over at the Republican headquarters. But now we're here at the Democratic headquarters with some results. And I'm here with Julie Kushner. First off, congratulations on the big win, big win. And um, anything you have to say, like going forward, like what are what are the plans? What are the goals for the district? Well, I have to say, first of all, it's just been an incredible night. Um, I've represented this district for four years and I'm looking forward to the next two years because I feel like we've come together as a community and that's sometimes very hard to do. And when I know you were in the room tonight and you saw the diversity of the people from Ridgefield to New Fairfield and all those folks from Danbury, we just have a very dynamic district. And so my plans are to work on a you know statewide level on some really important issues. I've been chairing the working group on indoor air quality in our public schools and that's so critical to our students learning and their health uh, and the people who work there too. So I intend to work on that. I've been ongoing working on the firefighters cancer relief fund and how do we really address the problems of our public servants who risk their lives, but unfortunately often get cancer in that process and we need to take care of them. There's big issues still from the pandemic like the, the heroes pay, the pandemic pay, which we know we need to go back in and put more money in there and make sure we've covered all the people we need to cover. So there's a lot of things that you know don't affect the whole state but are really important to big segments of our state. Um, of course, schools affects everybody. But I also feel like there's going to be so many opportunities, opportunities to continue the work we've done on a recovery for all so that coming out of this pandemic, we look at how do we use our revenues, how do we gain revenue? How do we make sure that we're taking care of middle class and working families and that we have a fair tax system and that we're using those expenses as well? So there's a lot yet to be done. And I probably left out half the things. I, I can't even think straight tonight, but it's been really an incredible night and yeah. an incredible win. Yeah, well, a lot of important stuff to unpack there. A lot of things going forward that we have to look forward to that are on the table for you and your team. Um, anything in specific that you want to say to the college students watching at home and the WCSU community, like going forward or for, for college students, you know, the, the value of a college education and being able to afford that as it's so important today in the, to get it to get a job, to be able to like provide for your family. That piece of paper is very important, but it's becoming very hard to, to obtain. Anything you have to say? Absolutely. First of all, I love WestCon, and I'm so happy that I live in Danbury and we have this great institution here. And I would love to see us make even deeper connections between the community and the university community. But I, I think what's really important is that young people come out and vote because your future depends on it. And, you know, I think about that in terms of my kids and my grandkids. We need young people and especially college students, you know, to come out and make sure they're voting. We want to tackle the tough issues like climate change. We need to look at equity issues and make sure we're addressing the needs of everyone and that we live in a fair society. And I know young people and I know especially WestCon students care about these issues. We need to protect a woman's right to choose. These are the issues of today and the issues of tomorrow, but it's the young people that are going to have the biggest impact on our future. So I'm really thrilled um, that so many people have been engaged. I'm so glad that you are covering these races and anything I can do to bridge those relationships between the community, between the students, just ask me because I totally believe in everything you're doing there. Awesome. Well, I'm sure the, the whole WestCon community thanks you and it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Thank you. Have a great night. Well, and that's all we have. <laughs>
Well, thanks, Jimmy. Great interview there. And uh, congratulations uh, to uh, Julie Kushner for her, her victory. Um, and uh, definitely excited to, uh, to see what she does yes. uh, with uh, another term in the position. So great stuff. She has big plans. Um, we're still waiting for some votes to be counted and, and for different results to come in. We're seeing a lot of these votes be really, really close. For example, in, in Georgia, it's pretty much guaranteed now that they will have to go to a runoff election. The Associated Press wow. is putting them at, uh, putting Herschel Walker at 49.2%, which is, you know, it's a high percentage. Yep. It's up there. Yep. But I don't think he'll break the 50% uh, in order uh, that's needed to, to avoid a runoff election. Mm -hmm. Purely because they have 85% in, yep. right? Yep. And uh, uh, Warnock is very close behind, yes. right? So I'd be, I'd be surprised to see if they end up uh, having to, um, if they don't have to go to a runoff, pardon me. But who knows? Again, it is hard to predict these things. And I could very easily be proven wrong in 15 minutes. So who knows? Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, some, some great stuff uh, overall. And um, yeah, really cool. Happy to see uh, some of these votes being counted. And some of these races being uh, uh coming to a close yeah right yes but we're gonna head now to uh something that has been on a lot of people's minds in america following the supreme court overturning of roe v wade via legal precedent same-sex marriage is it on the chopping block again in america let's take a look how would you feel if your 10-year-long marriage was over against your will same-sex marriage has been legal in connecticut since 2008 According to the United States Census Bureau, as of 2021, there were 711,129 same-sex married couples in the United States, with 336,922 being male couples and 374,207 being female couples. The House passed a legislation that would protect same-sex marriage nationwide as well as other marriage equality protections. This was to be expected with the majority being Democrats. However, it is uncertain if this legislation will make it past the Senate, where the ratio of Democrats and Republicans is split 50-50. With the overturn of Roe v. Wade, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wants to revise this matter. He stated, in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. This statement caused a lot of controversy across the country. Many were wondering about where same-sex marriage will stand. We spoke to some people to get their opinion on the matter. Well, I think it's incredibly unfair because he has no right to dictate someone else's life like that if he doesn't relate to it at all. What I feel is that the government shouldn't be sticking their noses in other people's businesses. According to a UCLA psychology study, many people believe gay men and women are more sexually promiscuous than heterosexuals, which they fear can threaten their own marriages and their way of life. Yo no lo critico, pero no los apoyo. Eh, pienso que el matrimonio es, debe ser heterosexual. We reached out to state Senate candidate Julie Kushner to get her stance on the matter. People should be able to marry whoever they love. And I think that our state, the state of Connecticut, has been in the forefront of this movement of recognizing love is love. We sent requests to Michelle Coelho's campaign for comment on the issue, but did not receive any response. If same-sex marriage laws were to be overturned, these couples would lose their federal marriage rights, such as being able to visit a spouse in the hospital, sponsor their spouse for immigration benefits, file income taxes jointly, and much more. Furthermore, the Supreme Court is looking into revising Griswold v. Connecticut, which protects the use of contraceptives between married couples. If that were to happen, if any of those things were to happen, it feels like we're, as a nation, going backwards and restricting people's rights rather than expanding people's rights and opportunities. Si se va a usar el anticonceptivo, si conviene o no conviene. Usted decide si desea hacerlo y por qué desea hacerlo, porque traer un hijo al mundo eh, es un compromiso. This is Madeline Herbert for WCSU News Election Connection. So interesting story there, seeing that uh, a lot of Americans are now again concerned by uh, uh, gay marriage possibly being threatened. Granted, some of the Supreme Court's most recent statements. However, we're going to just take a brief pivot from discussing that, and we're going to head to our field team. I uh, believe we have our field reporter, Tyler, here to give us some information on the Johanna Hayes v. George Logan race. How's everything looking out there, Tyler? 
Yeah, Jacob. So a slight fluctuation since the last time we talked. It's jumped up to about 40 eight percent for george logan instead of 47 percent previously obviously only 37 percent of the votes uh have been recorded thus far so still as you've been mentioning almost impossible to be able to call this one uh it's fluctuating non-stop seemingly uh so this this race will definitely be the closest or one of the closest as we've been projecting absolutely it definitely seems to be that way now Obviously, with races that are, are so close, uh, so tight like this, one has to ask the question, I mean, Tyler, what do you think is the issue that is resonating so much with people to cause this kind of, uh, this kind of you know, a, a tight, a tight, tight election between two different candidates that honestly have a lot of things that, yeah, they, they are different on, but they do have a couple things that they're pretty nonpartisan on. So I, I have to ask, you know, which which issue in particular do you think there is one that resonates uh, more with voters in this community or or not? Yeah, Jacob, it could be a plethora of things. Honestly, there's been a lot of speculation, uh, especially earlier here. There was uh, a bunch of supporters for Johanna Hayes just watching the news, uh, reacting to some of the other people calling George Logan's campaign uh, much stronger than hers. And the fact that he's painted himself as not the typical Republican, as I've mentioned before, and his stances on abortion being similar to hers as he's pro-choice could all be factors in the way that these uh, votes are being casted. And it could also lead him to a victory. We, we don't know at this point, but those are all factors that could possibly be swaying these votes. Absolutely. Well, it definitely seems like it. And whatever is the case here, uh, I mean, we are we are close. We're getting down to the wire here. We have 30 minutes left, a little over 30 minutes left of broadcast time, uh, unless we go late, which we might. It, it, we'll have to see. But I have to say, I mean, so far, it's amazing that uh, so many of these elections are still up in the air. You know, Florida, uh, which is a, a pretty large state population wise, mm -hmm was able to call there so early, and yet we have states like Ohio and Georgia and Pennsylvania, which are still not even close, which is just uh, amazing to me. It must be very contentious out there. But thank you so much, Tyler, for the information. Really do appreciate it, and uh, we'll come back to you shortly. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Of course. So obviously, we, we have uh, in, in front of us a lot of things that are going on here and a lot of different races that we're going to be taking a look at. But just to remind anyone who just tuned in, you are watching Election Connection. This is Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage for 2022. Tonight, we're discussing national and state races, including races in Fairfield County. Let's go to the board with Jake Nicolari to get an update on those races. Jake, make us smarter. All right, thank you guys. So tonight we are going to look at once again, all of the races, just like we did a little while ago. Uh, Ned Lamont versus Bob Stefanowski. Right now, we are unsure of who is going to win. We're not positive. But the Lamont campaign, we've heard from our field teams, is pretty confident that they have this uh, in the bag. That does not guarantee anything. It's just that they're pretty sure that they might win. Like we've said, Richard Blumenthal won for Senate. Uh, like Tyler was just talking about, the Johanna Hayes versus George Logan race is so, so close. Uh, a little more than 3,000 vote difference that this, this race could easily turn later in tonight or as more ballots are counted. Next, we're going to look at the 24th Congressional District. We already called this race uh, Julie Kushner, the winner. Next, we look at the 26th district. This district, much like before, uh, numbers literally haven't changed from before. C.C. Moore still in the lead, but not a guaranteed win. Okay, Tony Huang versus uh, Tim Gavin. This is not a guaranteed race either. Same numbers as before. Uh, these numbers are coming out much slower than a lot of the other numbers, but that could be because it's a state race and not a national race. Um, we're still waiting on results from some of our uh, state senate races, like I was just talking about. But we have confirmed from our field team, Ryan, that uh, William Tong has won for attorney general over Jessica Cordes. So this is uh, another uh, win for the incumbents in Connecticut. 
Uh, next, we'll be looking at the Secretary of State. This race, 30,000 vote difference. Uh, I think we are at about 40 to 50 percent of the count in Connecticut. So with these, uh, this could still go to the Republicans, but it is most likely going to go to Thomas uh, and the Democrats. Uh, we're still waiting on results from Danbury and uh, the Danbury race. And then next we'll be looking at states uh, races out of state now here we have mark kelly versus blake masters mark kelly once again just elected in 2020 with a special election uh, versus blake masters who has been a fully new name in politics funded specifically by uh far-right republicans and he really is not doing as well as mark kelly or as uh they predicted that he would. So Mark Kelly still has a considerable lead over Blake Masters, but this does not guarantee anything as Arizona is still well into counting votes. Next, we look at Georgia, where Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker both have 49% of the vote. Like I was saying earlier, this election, now with these numbers, I can almost tell you for sure is going to run off into a December election where Georgia will finally decide who is going to represent them in the Senate. Next, we have Nevada. And interestingly enough, we still have not gotten any numbers from Nevada. Um, but we move on to New Hampshire, where we see that Maggie Hassan is keeping her lead over Dan Bulldog. Uh, it's about a 30,000 uh, vote lead, but with only 40% of the vote being counted, this does not guarantee anything for Hassan. Next, we're going to be looking at the Ohio Senate, where J.D. Vance has been conclusively called the winner by the Associated Press and other uh, news groups. J.D. Vance, uh, similar to Blake Masters, is funded by uh, many far-right groups, endorsed by Trump and uh, will definitely shake up the Senate as a, a new uh, face in the Congress. Next, we have Pennsylvania, where we're looking at a very close race. I believe John Fetterman, with uh, 1,975,000 votes, is at about 90 uh, or 48 or 9 percent of the vote, while Mehmet Oz is at 47 or 48 percent of the vote. So much like Georgia, this race super close. And this race has also been very contentious for legal battles on both the Republican and the Democrat side. Republicans going after mail-in votes and uh, uh, early voting, which is uh, how many Democrats vote. And Democrats are right now going after uh, Republicans for how they are trying to proceed in the counting of votes. Both of these cases will determine this uh, race, so there is no way to call this race yet. Next, we look at the Utah, where Mike Lee has been able to keep his steady lead over Evan McMullen. Uh, this lead is not significant, but it, with Mike Lee being the incumbent and numbers still coming in, um, we can't be sure. So we'll uh, keep you updated if we get any more numbers before the end of the night. Now, in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson has actually been able to uh, stabilize his lead, most likely because Republicans are the majority of uh, day of voters. So uh, those votes are just getting counted, and that is probably why he has been able to take the lead back from Mandela Barnes. And next in Washington, we are looking at Patty Murray, the uh, a uh, Democrat incumbent who is keeping a safe lead over Tiffany Smiley at uh, nearly 200,000 votes. It's a significant and safe lead for her. Um, and that is going to be all for the election coverage. Next, we will come back uh, later tonight at some point. But for now, back to you guys in the studio. Well, thanks so much, Jake. Really appreciate those updates there. Uh, interesting to see how the races and the numbers have fluctuated throughout the night. We are currently seeing that with about 70 percent, according to the Associated Press, being counted, that uh, Dr. Oz is still a little bit behind uh, John Fetterman in Pennsylvania for the governor uh, for the governor race. So we'll have to see. But that margin keeps coming shorter and shorter now, Jake. It does. It keeps getting closer and closer. We'll have to see. I do think that Georgia will end up in a runoff race for governor. 
Um, I'd be incredibly surprised if it didn't at this point. Um, we are seeing the Republicans not perform as well in Arizona as we may have thought that they would, but I believe that they are performing well in Ohio. Obviously, nothing's been called yet, but it seems to me as if in Ohio we are looking at a possible, not for sure, but a possible Republican win uh, for Senate and governor. Uh, with J.D. Vance as, as governor. But again, we'll have to see. That's still with only about 80% reporting uh, from the Associated Press. So uh, interesting. Definitely uh, races are still tight. And uh, it's, it's incredible that they are as tight as they, they, they still seem to be. Um, and uh, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to see if we'll have to go into tomorrow and perhaps the next day before we actually get any official... Uh, official, you know, verdicts. Yeah. Speaking um, on the um, the uh, Pennsylvania race, do you think that uh, John Fetterman, um, he uh, his change of stance on fracking, do you think that has anything to do with such a short lead that he's holding right now? Well, so what Fetterman did with with fracking was about two years ago, he w took a very clear stance that he didn't like fracking and he thought it was bad for the environment. He wanted to uh, do some things to minimize um, how much drilling that uh, Pennsylvanians could do. And the issue with that, and, and, and the reason that it's not exactly a popular position for a politician to take in Pennsylvania is because it's a very large industry for them, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they have a lot of jobs in the fracking industry. And in his debate with Mohammed Oz, he actually pretty much entirely backpedaled. And he said he's fine with fracking, he stands with fracking, and that he wants to uh, make sure it's something that continues in Pennsylvania. Huh. So I think that sort of flip-flopping mm -hmm. is not something that a lot of people who maybe rely on fracking for their, their livelihood, mm -hmm. I don't think they're comfortable with that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that cost uh, Fetterman quite a few votes. Do you think that flip-flopping, flip -flopping, as uh, some politicians do, do you think that is uh, uh, a pet peeve that some voters have? So when, once they hear that, um, once they hear the backpedaling, they automatically vote for the other candidate? I think, unfortunately, a lot of Americans are so politically uninvolved that they might not care or they might not hear about the, the you know, back and forth, the, the 180 degree turn on policy issues. Understood. The ones that do, though, absolutely, yes. Okay. That, would, that would for sure push away from a candidate if you felt like they were being disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Understood. Um, and uh, one thing that's coming to the focus of American politics a little bit is NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Now, we were speaking about this a little bit earlier, kind of along the same vein as cryptocurrency. NFTs were something that a lot of people started looking into during the COVID pandemic when jobs were not as, uh, as, as easy to get. Yes. A lot of people were getting laid off. There were a lot of economic concerns. You know, certain things were just not stretching far enough. And a lot of people turned to... Uh, cryptocurrency and NFTs mm -hmm. as a possible source of income. So let's check out a story about NFTs. Would you believe with some of these images, somebody paid over $10 million just to own the digital art? Well, candidates in Minnesota, California, Arizona, Wisconsin, and even South Korea have taken to the trend Would you by selling their each own of these images that someone paid over fundings. $10 million just But first, what is an NFT? Art? Our reporter Stephen sat down with Dr. William Joel, retired professor emeritus for the Department of Computer Science at Western Connecticut State University, to discuss this innovative technology and its future. So if you can, uh, if you can just give a very brief, like 10 second definition of what an NFT is. Okay, N NFT, non-fungible token is the equivalent for uh, various digital products uh, equivalent to what Bitcoins are uh, using chains to make sure that if you receive a given digital product, you have the original and that can't be faked, which makes it equivalent to having, uh, for example, an original artwork. With this technology, Candidates can use the tokens to reward donors, attract supporters, build community, and make campaign events exclusive to token holders, with one Republican senatorial candidate netting his campaign over half a million dollars, and companies like Numero are building platforms catering to this growing trend. Collectibles is a uh, NFT platform to help you grow your grassroots community and raise more money. Uh, We'll be launching it uh, in the next couple months, but what we wanted to start out with is actually just educating the community. We have more than 600 campaign staff on the wait list 
for electables. So it's in South Korea. President Yoon Suk Yeol, who recently won his nomination, issued over 22,000 NFT tokens. What would you say are some drawbacks of NFTs? Uh, well, the drawbacks is that it is it is a specific technology based. Uh, similar, uh, it can be. Uh, well, think of the drawbacks with bitcoins. People do Bitcoin mining, etc. They make profit out of buying, selling, buying, selling, and don't don't really own. A major concern for NFTs is how it adds to climate change. Storing the data of NFT and crypto assets uses a lot of energy, with the majority coming from non-renewable sources. Last year, Elon Musk tweeted that Tesla would be canceling Bitcoin transactions until they transfer to renewable energy sources. There are also concerns of dark money entering politics as crypto assets are lightly regulated. According to the Congressional Research Services, as of May 2022, the Federal Election Commission has not issued formal guidance on NFTs. But FEC Commissioner Ellen Weintraub has said that the use of NFTs fits plainly into the existing rules and regulations as long as it falls within contribution limits. Are NFTs just a fad or the future? Again, too, too early to say. This is Joshua Rodriguez and Stephen Grant for WCSU News Election Connection. So we've definitely seen uh, NFTs and cryptocurrency come under fire a little bit yeah. uh, recently in, in American politics. We've seen uh, the White House and, and the Biden administration suggest that they may consider asking Congress to amend the Bank Secrecy Act, which would have pretty much apply certain restrictions to NFTs and cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Um, and this would essentially mean that uh, digital assets like the currencies that I just mentioned would have to be reported to the United States Treasury. Any sort of suspicious activity on one of these trading platforms would have to be investigated. They would be treated very similarly to the US dollar. Yeah. Um, which is something that a lot of people aren't happy with because they really try and, and want to use what they consider to be almost inflation-proof uh, products like, like Bitcoin, right, uh, as its own sort of currency. They kind of want to try and, and use that to almost break free from the dollar, if you will. It, yes, and also uh, uh, to add to that, it looks like big, uh, it looks like big um, corporations and um, wealthy, the wealthy are seeming to... Um, um, reap the benefits when it comes to NFTs, such as uh, uh, Dana White. Dana White is runs UFC, the most uh, prized promotion you know in the world right now. Yeah. Uh, so about seven months ago, he was making NFTs. Now he's not. Sure. Uh, I feel like the Biden administration is cracking down on the big dogs, so to call it, when it comes to making money and making sure that people like Dana White cannot make any more money that they're yeah. already making. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I would have to agree. Yeah. I think so, I think so. Well, so we're gonna head to our field reporter, Jimmy, now. He's got some quick updates for us. He's, uh, he's out there. Jimmy, how's everything looking? Yeah, Jacob, so I'm here at the Danbury Public Library, which is just across the street from Democratic headquarters. And I was just with you guys with that Julie Kushner interview. And she and her whole camp are just so excited, um, so excited to, to keep going and keep, keep doing what they have been doing as, as a campaign. And as they've been in since 2018, they are very excited to get another shot and another crack at it. I can imagine. It definitely seems like uh, something to be happy about. And when you were interviewing Julie Kushner before, she seemed ecstatic, right? Uh, very excited as to what her next couple years are going to hold here. Um, and, uh, you know, she's obviously already done a lot for Connecticut. So I'll be curious to see what she does in the future moving forward. Yeah, like I like I was mentioning earlier, the atmosphere here was just so electric. Uh, so many so many smiling faces here. We had a chance to go. Um, I did mention this to Republican headquarters, and they, as they were giving their concession speech, um, we got just the tail end of it. And they mentioned unity. Um, they they want to stay united as a Repu as the Republicans, just together and continue pushing what they believe is what's going to turn Connecticut around. They don't believe that the Democrats are going to do that, but it seems Democrats believe this is good. This is good. We are we are heading in the right direction and keeping this group in power is going to be the best thing for Connecticut moving forward. 
Right, of course. And it's interesting that you specify that the Republicans are seeking unity, especially because recently we have seen some division crop up in the Republican Party. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, Republican senators and governors and different politicians either be very pro-Trump or really want to leave the Trump era Republican Party behind. So that's something that Republicans in Connecticut and nationwide are really going to have to grapple with over the next couple of years to redefine themselves as a party to more accurately cater uh, themselves to the average voter. So definitely something that we're going to have to, uh, to, to look at and Republicans are going to have to work pretty hard to pick which way they're going to go. But um, it's great that you got to hear at least part of the concession speech uh, from the Coelho campaign. And uh, thank you so much, Jimmy, for interviewing Julie Kushner before. That was a great interview. Really appreciate all the information that you've given us tonight. You've been doing a great job out there, so thank you. I appreciate that, Jacob. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Have a good one. You too, man. Be safe. Well, so uh, great stuff there from our field reporter. Sounds like he got a brief listen to Michelle Coelho's uh, closing uh, uh, statements, I suppose you could say. Obviously, she is the candidate in Connecticut who rescinded her, her campaign as the numbers started to come out tonight. Um, but uh, really quick here, we're going to take a break from some politics and check out the weather with student meteorologist Steve. So, Stephen, how's everything looking? Well, uh, unlike the last uh, time I checked in, really not much has changed since the last time, but we'll run through it again here at 11 o'clock. Now, we do have one interesting thing that I want to point out. At 11 o'clock, the Danbury Airport reported that the temperature was 5 degrees warmer than it was at 10. I'm a bit suspicious of that. There's really not a meteorological reason that that really could, should have happened. Uh, I wonder if there was some sort of an error reporting the data there. But either way, right now, officially, the temperature is 43 degrees in Danbury with a dew point of 20. That's a 40% humidity and wind out of the north at 8 miles an hour, which also adds to kind of my questioning of how the temperature could have gone up. Uh, at, at night with the wind out of the north. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you never know. So a few more warm days are ahead. That's, to, again, that is Thursday and Friday. Then we do have a major storm on Friday and Saturday, and that actually very much flips the pattern. I haven't really said that through the night, but that will flip the pattern into a much more November-like pattern next week. Uh, definitely looks like we'll be well below average. And we do have a chance at our first flakes on Sunday night as a result of that. So we'll show you that in a moment. First up, satellite, nothing to talk about here. No clouds and no rain. So a nice night overall in terms of precip, but it is a bit chilly out there. What is going to be a concern Friday night, though, is this tropical storm, Nicole, which is almost a hurricane, just five miles an hour short. It's expected to make landfall as a Category 1 in Florida, south, uh, right uh, between Miami and Cape Canaveral. And then it'll shift off to the north and eventually pass very close to the Danbury area, perhaps just to our west. That puts us on the windier side of it, however, with the storm tracking more inland now than it was a couple of hours ago, uh, we would see a bit less in the way of wind. So overall, that's not the worst thing that could happen. Uh, we do still, however, expect, unfortunately, as much as one to four inches of rain uh, Friday night into Saturday. Now that, right now, I'm inclined to be on the lower end of that just because of the location of the storm, uh, but the four inches is close enough that I can't completely rule that out. So we have to be careful about that. Winds dusting to 40 are possible uh, with very scattered tree and power damage. Now, like I was saying earlier, there's a big difference between 40 and 50 miles an hour, especially here in Connecticut. Uh, 40 miles an hour, we can deal with. We will have, you know, yeah, there will be some twids down and we'll get a few power outages here and there, but it certainly uh, is nothing to be overly concerned about. So uh, if it is indeed only in the 40 to 50 mile an hour range, that's a lot better than it would have been if we were in the 50 to 60 mile an hour range like it looked like we could have been uh, a bit earlier tonight. And I, I mean, we still could be, but right now it does look like we will catch a bit of a break on the wind. So for tonight, 
Uh, one thing that we certainly are absolutely uh, certain of is that there's going to be a very hard freeze tonight. We're going down into the mid-20s, so any plants must be inside. Uh, wind out of the north, 3 to 6 miles an hour. And then tomorrow is going to be a really nice day, as long as you don't mind it being a little bit chilly. Uh, this is actually about normal for this time of year, but it's going to feel a lot chillier than the mid-50s simply because we've had so many days up in the, uh, in some cases, upper 70s uh, over the last few days. So it'll be a bit of a welcome to back to reality as we head on through the week. Thursday, though, it's right back to the mild air, 64 degrees and sunny, a beautiful day Thursday. Friday starts out sunny but then the, and warm, but then the clouds increase, and then whatever is left of Tropical Storm Nicole will hit us Friday night into Saturday with some heavy rain and dusty winds. We dry things out Saturday afternoon, but the temperatures absolutely plunge Saturday night. The pattern completely flips. Sunday, 47 is as high as we go, with clouds increasing and then showers developing in the afternoon, a nasty, cold, showery afternoon. In the overnight, we could have a chance at our first flakes of the year, especially in the higher elevations of Litchfield County. So, uh, you know, a bit of a wake-up call that it is, in fact, mid-November, and, you know, it is starting to get into that season where we can get snow, but overall... Uh, the big story remains uh, the impact of Nicole Friday night and Saturday. Thank you all. Well, thank you so much for all the weather reporting there, Stephen. We really do appreciate it. And I just want to offer a special thank you to Ryan Lynch and Zach Cummings uh, for their assistance. They are they're alumni of Western Kansas State University and uh, they came back to do some research for us here at Election Connection. So much appreciated. Thank you to both of those gentlemen. Uh, so yeah, we're seeing a lot of numbers still coming in here. We have votes coming in. It's honestly crazy to uh, to even even try and parse some of these elections out and, and make any sort of judgment. We are seeing here a lot of the governor races um, that were up for grabs go Republican, but again, Quite a few of them are still up in air. You know, we're still having Arizona, uh, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, New York are all still up in air, which is places where the, the Democrats are expected to win the governorship. Um, and uh, as far as the Senate, <laughs> a lot of these races are so close, it's hard to tell, though a few of them have been called already, especially in places like California. Um, now, what we're going to do is, uh, real quick, we're just going to celebrate the WXCI 50th anniversary. We want to say a special thank you, pardon me, uh, to our student radio station here at Westcon, WXCI 91.7 FM. They've helped us a lot over the last couple of years. So let's go to that tribute right now. Rob Abbott, nicknamed Rabbit, began the first ever broadcast with Good Afternoon. This is FM radio station WXCI in Danbury, beginning its first broadcast day. These words were just the beginning of an illustrious history for the many voices of the past and today heard on WXCI. I'm DJ Poppins on 91.7 FM, coming to you from the Midtown campus of Western Connecticut State University. We will be celebrating 50 years of continuous student-run radio in 2000. Election Connection. Since the beginning of Election Connection in 2011, WXCI has been right there, streaming the show on FM airwaves. WXCI's history with election coverage dates back to our beginnings from 1973. In the 70s, election results were reported on WXCI because FM radio continued to broadcast long after other media sources signed off for the night. In 1982, as documented in Rolling Stone magazine, WXCI was one of the leading college radio and FM stations playing alternative rock. This introduced such groups as REM, Talking Heads, Depeche Mode, U2, the B-52s, among others, to the greater Danbury listening community. That's right, it's all been happening here at WXCI. This is, uh... These listeners included high school students, some of whom would join the ranks of WXCI DJs. WXCI showed up in print again in Piper Kerman's 2010 memoir, Orange is the New Black. 
She reminisced listening to WXCI's specialty show, 90s Mixtape, as a soundtrack for her life. Today, we look back and see WXCI provided joy through music, camaraderie, and the Alumni Life Membership Program. The station served as a training ground and opened doors into professional radio. In 2023, we look forward to celebrating 50 years on the airwaves. Please show, share your love, support, and memories with us on our Facebook page, WXCI 91.7 Alumni, and our contact info on WXCI.org. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us again after that brief tribute for WXCI. And again, 50-year anniversary of that radio station being on the air. Just great stuff. And we can't wait to see the next 50 years of what WXCI has to offer the local community. But in the spirit of Election Connection, we're going to go now to our man at the board, Jake Nicolari, who's going to give us an update on some of the races we've been covering throughout the evening. Jake, let's see how things are turning out. All right, guys, this is going to be our last coverage of the night where we're going to start talking about races in Connecticut. This is our last update on the governor's race where Ned Lamont's at about 300,000 votes and Bob Stefanowski's at about 260,000. This is a pretty good lead for Ned Lamont and likely that uh, Ned Lamont will uh, keep his seat uh, through the incumbent seat. Next, we, uh, we have our CT winner for Blumenthal. Uh, this race, the 5th Congressional District, still close as ever. Uh, Johanna Hayes, only about 2,000 votes ahead of George Logan. So this race is probably going to be decided either sometime much later tonight or tomorrow. Um, so we won't be able to update you on that, but please stay updated on that race. Uh, like we said, Julie Kushner was the winner of that race. This race hasn't been decided yet, the 26th Congressional District, but C.C. Moore is uh, by uh, the current votes uh, projected to win, but that does not mean anything, seeing as only about 30 to 40 percent of the votes have been counted. Um, Tony Huang really starting to make a difference in uh, between him and Gavin. Now, this does not mean that he will win, but it does show signs that he might be able to hold on to his incumbent seat. We still have not been able to get a lot of the numbers for local races tonight, which has made uh, reporting on Danbury specifically hard. Um, we announced that Tong was the winner for uh, Attorney General. And uh, our Secretary of State race is still very close with Stephanie Thomas only about uh, 20,000 votes ahead of Dominic Raplini. Uh, this is a pretty good lead, but once again, does not guarantee anything. Um, we're still waiting on local results. Um, but then we can move on and we can go and we can look out of state where we're looking at Arizona, where Mark Kelly has really separated himself from Blake Masters, especially based on the polling that we had before the race. We really thought that this race would be a lot closer, but it's seeming that Democrats in Arizona are doing a lot better than we projected, which is um, going to make the Senate control probably much closer than uh, predicted that it would be. Next, we're looking in Georgia, where the race, uh, Herschel Walker has been able to make his lead and keep it, but this lead is nothing in this race. This is still 49% to 49% of the vote, definitely going into a runoff uh, this winter, but we, you know, we can't be sure of anything as the vote hasn't been decided yet. In Nevada, interestingly enough, tonight we still have not received any information or numbers um, and may, many other uh, news sites uh, like CNN and Fox have still not received any numbers from Nevada, the Nevada Senate, Governor, or House races. So um, something is most likely happening to cause this, either long lines planned by Republicans or uh, votes not being counted like machine failures like we had in Connecticut tonight. Um, next, we look at New Hampshire, where Maggie Hassan has been declared the winner over Don uh, Bolduc, which is not entirely surprising based off of the numbers we saw earlier tonight or the uh, Associated Press's um, predictions on this race. But uh, congratulations to Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. 
in Ohio, much like before, J.D. Vance has been declared the winner. After 91% of the vote was in, he had about a 300 uh, or a 30,000 vote lead, which was enough, um, or 300,000, sorry about that, 300,000 vote lead, which was enough to guarantee him the win with that last 10% counting. Now, this race, the Pennsylvania Senate race, let me tell you, this race has been close all night and probably will continue to be close for the next week uh, as Republicans plan to count ballots for as long as they possibly can. Um, this race, John Fetterman has been able to put his lead up over Mehmet Oz, but um, with recent polls, it's likely that Mehmet Oz might pull through in the end once uh, in-person ballot uh, voting is finally counted. Um, next, we will look at the Utah Senate, where Mike Lee has been able to keep his lead and his incumbent seat for um, over Evan McMullen, the Independent. Lastly, we'll go to Wisconsin, where we're starting to see some real big numbers. Uh, Ron Johnson has made a 100,000 or almost 100,000 vote uh, lead on Barnes, which is not going to guarantee him this seat, but it is most likely going to give it to him. And then finally, we'll look in Washington, where Democrat Patty uh, Murray has been able to make a considerable lead over Smiley, pretty much guaranteeing her this seat. Um, and that is all for Election Connection. Thank you for staying tuned for these numbers. And we hope that these races that still have not been answered get answered very soon so you guys know who controls the House, who controls the Senate, and what the makeup of our Congress is. Thank you, guys. Back to you in the studio. Well, thank you so much, Jake, for the updates there. We really do appreciate it. We want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for watching Election Connection this year. We hope to have you next year. I'm Jacob Schultz. I'm Alec Riasik. And uh, we'll see you next year. Good night.